Hello. Okay, can I ask everyone to take a seat? We are about to start. Thank you. We have an exciting but long program ahead, so let's get started. Ah, good. And this one's well? Yes, this is Okay, perfect. Okay, before we start, I will ask all of the speakers to gather closely. I see most of you have done so. Uh, to keep the team free, as we did this morning, we will not ask you to sit in front, but ask you one by one to come up, and then you stay close, and if uh, after your joint sessions we have some time for Q&A, we can uh, take it from the floor. All right. All right, we're green light to go. So uh, welcome everybody to this afternoon session at the uh, exciting Ocean Data Week at the Genova Ocean Race Final. I'm very excited. We had a very interesting program this morning. A lot of uh, information, a lot of new information as well. Some things that we already knew in terms of the framework, but uh, a lot of very interesting initiatives going on and it's good to get connected. And this afternoon, we will continue the discussions um, on the importance of collecting and processing data, uh, looking specifically at addressing questions related to environmental challenges um, and related to climate change, and with a view to really looking for uh, solutions that are uh, able to serve our decision makers, so the right tools to implement our new European mitigation policies. So first of all, we will look at the European level uh, actions, in particular eModnet, um, on the collection and integration um, efforts that we are doing with some very concrete uh, examples. Um, from that we will look at um, more global level, some of the contributions to um, the global ocean and climate observing system, and particularly from the ship-based observations. Then we'll try to have a comfort break. If we have time, we will. Let's hope. Um, and then Afterwards, we will look at um, some of the, uh, the impacts uh, from, uh, from changes that we observe and expect, in particular from uh, changes that are happening in the polar regions. And then we will conclude with uh, looking at the relevance and importance of these European efforts to address European uh, challenges, but also global challenges under uh, the, uh, the decade, uh, for one, but um, also under our EU Green Deal. What can we do more and what can we do better for the benefit of all? So, without further ado, I'm uh, happy to introduce um, Remy Denos from the European Commission, Director General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, who will uh, give an introduction to set the scene on the framework for European marine data and observation. Remy, you are joining us remotely. I can see you on the screen. Are you ready? Yes. The floor is yours. I'm trying to share my screen. I'm not sure of what you see. Perfect. It's perfect like this. Yes. Good afternoon. I hope the weather is nice in Genova. I'm sure it's it's okay it's with a bit of wind for sailing. Um, yeah, so just a, a quick introduction on uh, why uh, we need uh, ocean observation in the in the EU context, or I would say at the European Commission. Well, we, we need it for a number of our policies. Research and innovation is probably uh, the first one. We, we need it for environmental policy, climate policy. We need it for the blue economy. So it's not, uh, of course, the challenge is always to reconcile or consile uh, the economy with, uh, with the environment. And, and this is translated in concrete terms in a number of our uh, EU legislation. I'm working in DG Mare, so the first legislation that comes to my mind is, of course, the fisheries policies. 
for, for which uh, there are a number of uh, ocean observation being made. Uh, so the, it's always a, always a bit touchy because um, it's, these observations are the ownership of member states and, uh, and, and, and sharing these uh, lies basically is, is their decision. Uh, we use a special type of uh, ocean observation for maritime special planning. I will say a few words, and and, and for some of the of our environmental policies. So this is mostly with teaching environment. Uh, so just just a few words about maritime special planning. So it's a special type of observation in the sense that what what we're trying to achieve is to get from member states plan or, or their plans to uh, let's say use quote quote. Uh, the maritime space uh, with boats, uh, with uh, ports, uh, with uh, wind farms, uh, but also with uh, marine protected areas, uh, with protection measures and, and, and so on. So, so this is one, uh, let's say, aspect with which, in addition of the common fisheries policy, we're dealing directly at DG Mare. I'm turning now to the Marine Strategic Framework Directive. This is a more a policy of DG environment, but uh, you see that what they are expecting from the member states is an assessment of the good environmental status of their uh, of their waters, and this translates to a number of descriptors. And you can you, you see them on the right hand side. It's about biology. It's about fisheries, of course. It's about eutrophication. It's about contaminants. It's about human activities. So say putting energy and noise and, uh, and and unfortunately also marine litter so so all of these are uh, require some environmental observation and I would say not just in one point uh, but uh, well on on the let's say territorial waters of the member states and ideally uh, when when this is possible also to to have a, a state at sea basin level. Uh, so this is quite uh, intensive, let's say. Uh, research and innovation. So here, of course, it's uh, to, to progress with our knowledge on the environment, on the climate. Uh, you have all heard about uh, the mission uh, on Restore Our Ocean and Waters by 2030, that is under Horizon Europe, several hundreds of millions of euros uh, invested or, or made available for the research community and for the technology community in the, in the three first years. Uh, you find also research topics under cluster fix on food, bioeconomy, natural resources, agriculture, and environment with a special area here on sea, ocean, and inland waters. And, and of course, I'm forgetting, what well, I'm not forgetting, but uh, we have also um, many, uh, I would say over hundreds of projects from Horizon 2020, so the predecessor program, which are uh, not yet finished, so which are ongoing and, and contribute to the, to, the, to the knowledge base. If I now step back and try to look uh, at the situation of ocean observation in the EU, well, we see that, of course, there are many different types of infrastructures and uh, with some coordination, I would say, per types of infrastructures. Uh, we have also many different responsibilities. So, of course, uh, if it's about research, it could be the Ministry of Science and Education. If it's about uh, the MSFD or, let's say, environmental policy, it would be uh, in the Ministry of Environment, if there is one. So, all, all this to say that depending on the countries uh, and depending on what we're talking about, different ministries are in charge. So, the, the picture is a bit fragmented and, and complex. And, uh, and we have a, a number of initiatives, which you see here on the, on the bottom left uh, hand side, uh, which try to, to coordinate uh, some of the observation. But I would say that even the, even, the, even the coordination is sometimes fragmented with many initiatives, many associations, and many projects. So you see here in the center a number of, uh, of projects or initiatives, which also go in the sense of, uh, of ocean observation. Uh, so, so your, your uh, first question, Jan Bart, was about uh, what, what is the framework <laughs> uh, on ocean observation at EU level? Well, in fact, I would say that uh, 
the, the framework is very fragmented. So the framework is a very uh, complex picture uh, with shared responsibility in several places, also in the commission, uh, different DGs involved. And, um, and we have to make efforts to, uh, to move towards a, a true framework, that's for sure. So that's all I wanted to say to uh, maybe give a bit of uh, food for thought for the discussion. And uh, one, one thing that we do, and, and this will be uh, hopefully a, a good transition for you and Bath and to the next speaker, is uh, at DG Mare, we fund this EMODnet initiative, European Marine Observation Data Network, to precisely centralize at EU level no, well, data and knowledge and data products at uh, EU level uh, that is made available for the, for the community. And, and uh, yes, and, and in such a way that the uh, ocean observation that is being carried out uh, bears a, a maximum of fruit across, across the EU. And uh, I, I, I will stop here for my intervention. Thank you, Ian Bart. Thank you, uh, Remy. And um, yes, I'm a class. very informative um, and a perfect transition indeed to the to the second session and Remy will stay with us for the for the final concluding roundtable discussion so I would uh, in the interest of time recommend that we let all of this sink in a little bit we'll listen to the to the different contributions and presentations and then if you have any further questions for Remy you could ask uh, in the final session yeah Thanks a lot. So indeed, um, a perfect introduction to the next session, which is all about the European Marine Observation and Data Network, which has been uh, long term funded by uh, the European Commission, DG Mare. But really, as a, as a response, oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> As a response to, to a, a joint uh, community perspective uh, and call, in, as long back as in 2006, where the community came together and asked and said, this is very important, we need this at European level. And the Commission took up this challenge and we'll hear about all the rest from you, Kate and the colleagues. Please, go ahead. Thank, thank you very much. So I'm going to try and compete with the exciting announcements that are going on with the Ocean Race finale outside. Uh, Remy, is, uh, Remy Denos gave a very great introduction, uh, an overview of eModnet, and I also gave a presentation this morning. Um, so I will repeat a few um, slides just to bring everybody up to speed who may not have heard uh, that. Uh, but I'm going to specifically talk a bit more now about how eModnet, the in situ marine data, can be used for EC and EU uh, policy implementation and also the different types of data that are available for addressing climate change. I actually don't have a pointer. Ah, there it is. <laughs> Um, I also note that I'll give a quick um, overview. I can't go into depth of the thematics, but my presentation is then followed by a presentation on chemistry and physics as well. So we've seen this morning, and also Remy showed the different platforms that, and infrastructures that exist for um, taking measurements of the ocean. And I just want to re reiterate how vital it is that we collect the marine environmental data uh, for so many different purposes. Um, it's uh, baseline understanding. Um, we know so little still about the ocean and about how ocean is changing in response to climate change uh, and vice versa. Uh, providing the evidence, member states at the European level have to report on their good environmental status. They need to um, collect data um, as evidence um, for different descriptors. And there's many different policies as well. Um, then in terms of collecting the data that can not only be used for delayed mode policy implementation, but in near real time for modeling, uh, for scenarios, and then in the future, bringing all the data together so it's interoperable, so that we can create big data lakes, we can do simulations and, and predictions through um, tools such as the digital twin ocean. Um, not only though are marine environmental data important, but the human activities information that, that um, goes with it. And this is one of the unique points of eModnet, that it brings together not only marine environmental data, but data from human activities at sea. So point data on the different platforms, um, the different operators, uh, vessel density, um, information, etc. But also marine spatial planning, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and so com these combination of, of data sets are really important to look at human impacts to improve evidence-based management uh, of space at sea through MSP, um, but also supporting the private sector. It's a win-win for the private sector to share its data with, with the likes of eModnet. Then you get higher resolution data to help operations at sea, 
for baseline understanding and for siting or micro-siting, I should say, of different um, offshore platforms. And also, eModNet produces um, generic data layers and data products that the industry business can um, innovate and create their own applications on top. Um, then I'm going to whiz through this because a lot this morning uh, about this, but just to reiterate that we're talking about the in situ, the, so the in water data collection, the subsea um, collection of, of data, and for tackling the grand societal challenges like climate change, we need sustained ocean observation. We need to promote data sharing so that all stakeholders collecting data will share, share information with uh, eModnet and other data services. But we also need sustained data services. eModnet, for example, is very operational. It has good funding, but it's not long-term funding. Um, so we need to really think about the governance um, and funding models of the data services as well as the data collection to make sure we're providing the, the information that users so, so increasingly need. Um, eModnet, in a nutshell, it's one single portal now. Um, you can have access through one map viewer, one metadata catalog to all of the um, offer of eModnet. One unique selling point is the different thematics. There are seven very broad thematics of uh, data and lots of uh, parameters, variables within that. Um, it's a huge community of many partners and experts. Um, it's surface to sea floor, it's coast to open ocean. So it's really a very... Um, diverse uh, data service and it's one of the most comprehensive in Europe for a number of different parameters. It's the place to go for, for example, bathymetry, high resolution bathymetry and a digital terrain model. It's the place to go for um, seabed habitats. There's an EU sea map, which is a predictive model capacity as well um, for mapping uh, seabed habitats. It's the place to go for marine litter for chemistry, which Alessandra will, will speak about and many different uh, parameters. And all the data products are completely freely available through a Creative Commons uh, license. The data sets are mostly open source. Some of the data providers prefer to keep uh, the data um, uh, behind, uh, let's say, a closed door. But the metadata always explains where that data is. And you can always then contact the data owner. This is the map viewer showing vessel density, for example. And I really encourage you to, to visit eModnet if you haven't already and explore. That's the seabed habitat map that I mentioned. And then also there are some um, data that are produced in near real time, which eModnet offers. One example is the Ocean Race, which is a great partnership together with other uh, data services where um, some of the environmental sensors have been fitted to the, sh the hulls of the yachts that are coming in now. And um, in this collaboration, we're um, collecting ocean physics and ocean chemistry data. And some of this is being streamed in near real time. So then, looking at the use, the use of eModnet uh, services, eModnet really supports uh, EU policy implementation. Um, I've mentioned some already. Um, and the wider EU Green Deal. In terms of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, there are so many um, ways that uh, data are being used. But just to give you um, a sort of flavor, um, eModnet biology, for example, you can see it's spanning phytoplankton up to marine mammals. So it's really important for different descriptors on biological diversity. But that then feeds into the seabed habitats, which also relies on geological data, bathymetry data, and more um, to produce uh, seafloor integrity and information on the biological component. The chemistry data, there's a lot of work with EC and JRC on marine litter uh, contaminants. And eModnet physics is now also collecting underwater noise. Um, for marine spatial planning, there's many elements as well. So firstly, eModnet has um, become the host of national marine spatial plans. So this is, um, it's, it's still the case that a member state submits its MSP plan to the commission. But then once that's done, eModnet will work with that member state to create the data layers, the geospatial visualization of all of those uh, marine spatial plans, making it much more usable and interoperable with different uh, countries. And at the same time, um, member states, uh, countries can use eModnet's marine environmental data and human activities data to produce its marine spatial plans. So there's a nice cycle um, that, that's been set up there, and that's, that's really evolving. Um, there's many use cases, so I, I urge you to visit, again, the eModnet website. We heard, for example, this morning from an NGO, Outdoor Portofino, that's based here uh, in Liguria. Um, which uses uh, eModnet data. Um, from the private sector, an example of using eModnet uh, parameters for reducing the uncertainty 
and improving the siting of um, offshore wind farms as well. And then talking about the, the private sector and blue economy, um, there's many ways that eModNet has dialogues, uh, many added values. So if there's anybody from the private sector here or online who would like to know more, please do get in touch. We have an associated partnership scheme which offers a closer dialogue with, um, with all of the eModNet experts, and it's a free um, voluntary uh, network and flexible. And then just to, to finish off, I wanted to leave you with um, a flavor of eModNet service offer for climate change. In fact, all of the data could be used for climate change, but in particular for coastal adaptation, you have uh, geology producing migration, um, and then in physics as well, you have uh, many different um, sea level trends and anomalies. And then some of those uh, data layers are also powering um, an EC communication tool called the European Atlas of the Seas, which is used more for ocean literacy and education, but it's a way to get ocean data, ocean information out to society, and it includes uh, storytelling as well to really bring awareness and understanding of the ocean. And then very lastly, I just wanted to mention that eModNet is really evolving. It works very closely with Copernicus Marine Service, which um, does more the satellite or remote sensed data and the modeling. And it's creating together um, the backbone for the European Digital Twin Ocean, which will also be a game changer for climate change uh, analysis. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'll now pass to other eModNet colleagues. Thank you so much, uh, Kate, and to, for, for showcasing a little bit the breadth of all the activities that uh, eModNet has been involved in and is involved in. Um, quite central eh? um, in this marine knowledge value chain, all the way upstream, assisting with the coordination of observation with colleagues from Eurogoose and others, but also really in the data management and sharing sphere. But also downstream, as you said, with the European Atlas, reaching out to, uh, to a very broad public and showing the power of what you can do with collecting and harmonizing all of the data and converting into maps. So Kate, uh, the head of the EMOTNET Secretariat, gave the introduction and uh, setting the scene. We'll pass over to Alessandra Giorgetti, uh, who is the coordinator of EMOTNET Chemistry. Please, Alessandra. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Bart. So now I will provide you a bit more information and description on the, on the Marine Data Service for Chemistry, which is the EMODNET uh, Chemistry. I want to start uh, with these pictures that uh, represent the network which is behind uh, the EMODNET Chemistry, because I think that this is uh, uh, one of the strengths uh, of, uh, of, of this uh, uh, lot. In fact, uh, uh, we, as you can see, we have representatives of, of marine institutes and environmental monitoring agencies from all, um, from 32 countries, so from all uh, EU uh, countries and even beyond. And we have 66 uh, European centers supported by five international organizations, which are indeed working together. In, in very tight contact with the data providers. So this wide network is indeed uh, useful because can can be the, indeed in touch uh, with, at country level with all the, the data providers. So now which kind of data we manage? Uh, we manage data uh, related to uh, marine debris, as uh, you see, which means it's data related to pollution of different kind. So coming from the, going from the numbers of litter objects, which are dispersed on beaches and on the seafloor, to the concentration of different uh, pollution, of different contaminants like hydrocarbons, heavy metals, and so on, released on the sea to the concentration of chemicals like nitrogen, phosphorus, and silicate, and all the other uh, compounds that uh, uh, evidence, uh, gives evidence of the uh, eutrophication. All these uh, 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 parameters, uh, well, the main challenge of our uh, activity is to deal with this high heterogeneity and complexity of data because all these parameters are collected with different uh, measurement uh, uh, methods, different laboratory methods and, and 
and over three matrices, let's say water, sediment, and bi biota, and all this kind of information needs to be associated to the data, needs to be collected together with the data. Otherwise, the data themselves cannot be reused uh, in the future um, when managed all together. So these uh, uh, metadata are as much as important as the data, the numbers uh, themselves. So a big activity is also to integrate all this uh, information in uh, a, a unique data and metadata with unique data and metadata standards. So the data initially have their own format, have their own uh, names of parameters and so on, but at the end, when you go to the Emodnet platform, all the data will be converted to the same format and the user can have this access to integrated and harmonized information. How this is achieved? Thanks to the collaboration of the data originators at first that release the main source of information, but then these are supported by the data managers from the research institutes that goes under the standardization of uh, data with the uh, common tools which helps uh, this uh, process, but still that have been developed a long time, a long years. Uh, all these data are then gathered together uh, in regional collections. Under this process, the, some issues came, can come out on the data, but uh, thanks to the initial slide that I show you the network of data centers, any issue that comes out uh, on this process is reported back to the data originators. So this is the strength of this quality control loop. So uh, the direct connection with the data provider is never broken, <laughs> let's say. We are always uh, from the collection till the production of these harmonized and quality control data, data sets which are the main input to the further uh, activities. Uh, these are the main product of the project, but also the input for data products, which can be computed at global scale. Are some of them are released by uh, the platform, but others, the, the, the users, having different uh, of, um, research and having different uh, objectives can can uh, uh, take advantage of this uh, of these collections. One of the examples of use that we have had of this uh, the aggregated the immunet chemistry harmonized data sets <coughs> for beach litter were used for the assessment of litter abundance, trends, and distribution. And this is one of the main step of the MSFT process for the Scriptor 10. So they compute it, it's not, uh, the, the, thanks to the, this collection, the policy makers were able to compute baselines, base, uh, starting from which they are then uh, defining thresholds and the measures for uh, <laughs> try to achieve a, a good environmental status. So citizen science, as we are here, but indeed plays an important role in, in this uh, uh, value chain. And uh, in particular, this vessels, data collected with the vessels uh, of opportunity. This is the pictures uh, from the Imodnet chemistry, from the Imodnet, let's say, portal, uh, the central portal that Kate mentioned. And where you can see the route and the data released, the, the previous, uh, uh, two previous races, uh, the uh, versions of the race, 17, 18, and 21, they collected the microliter data, and this data, thanks to the data ingestion portal, through the data ingestion, which is a very uh, easy system to uh, submit the data to a modern portal, yeah, these data were submitted and are made available for further additional use. So indeed the cruises at the end evidence some, gave evidence of microliter presence along their route. So they 
promoted their own data, but these data are further again used also by the scientific community, thanks to the uh, inclusion to Imodnet portal. Last uh, uh, slide to say that, uh, well, with the Blue Cloud initiative, which federates the main blue data infrastructures, included Imodnet and Copernicus, uh, and provides computing and analytical resource in one collaborative pl platform to undertake world-class research. So every single laboratory sharing its data, its information contributes to this uh, big system and the, this big picture. It's like a, a matrioska, I would say. The laboratory release data to the data centers that includes data to Imodnet network that is connected on a global scale. So from a single small action, we can get uh, a, a big results. <laughs> and with this, uh, I will close. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. We'll um, finalize with uh, this session with uh, Antonio Novellino and we'll take one or two questions afterwards. Um, I, it struck me that uh, in your presentation, Alessandra, you make it sound as if it's also easy. You know, it's easy ingestion, the whole process of uh, producing, um, harmonizing, etc. I'm sure it's not, so if you can maybe reflect later on a little bit, what are the main challenges, what are, where are the difficult uh, aspects in terms of the quality control or other things that you are struggling with most would be interesting. Um, Antonio Novellino, coordinator of Imotnet Physics, please give us uh, some examples of what yeah, you are doing. I mean, the idea was just to give some further example of how Imonet is working in some in different portals. So we have a very nice introduction on chem I mean, of general Imonet Central than with uh, a taste of uh, chemistry. And now we go to physics. Uh, that somehow we are also lucky because physics, uh, I mean, the ocean physics is somehow very, I mean, it's including, is the ones that we started being global and it's also touching some of the other initiatives that we are talking uh, later on uh, during the day. So uh, modern physics is focusing on in-situ data and products and integrates and makes available near real time and deleted mode. And I want to say, I mean, we were discussing this morning, <laughs> we are integrated, we are integrators, we are not running platforms. So without the contribution of each single data sources, we won't make it uh, possible. So it's uh, quite important things to say, and we need to always thank all the contributors. And the idea behind Imonet and uh, physics in particular was also to build on top of a uh, infrastructure. I mean, uh, Alessandra already presented the, the kind of network that we have behind. And this is quite important because it's the, val the added value that we can provide when we collect and integrate the data at the central level. And then, of course, we need to also work on new, new pipeline, pipelines, new uh, parameters, because we need to answer to some new questions. Uh, Alessandra, again, presented the problem uh, micro uh, of the litter uh, in physics. Uh, Kate already mentioned that we are uh, tackling uh, the um, underwater noise, but we were also asked to make available ocean um, river outflow data, for example, because it's a quite important component for, uh, I mean, both people that are working at the ocean, because, I mean, the salinity or the fresh water is coming out from uh, the rivers, as well as it's also a quite important uh, information for, I mean, the land <laughs> uh, people, the people that are working on the land. So we are in the, working on all the physical parameters. So, uh, and just to also give you, I mean, a, a very brief uh, overview how easy it is to get access to the data if all the chain behind is working properly. So if we can use the same standards, if we use the same tools, if we share data, if we inform Ocean Ops, and we're going to have a presentation about that, about the possibility to have data collected somewhere in the, in the world, then we can easily find them in a, an integrating platform like Imonet. So, uh, as was saying, you go to the central portal, you click on the uh, catalog, uh, you choose the in-situ platform in this case, and then you get this kind of view. Of course, I mean, this is uh, all the data that we received for the past 30 years. And then I always say this is an artifact because sometimes you say, you can, if you look at this picture, you say, oh, well, we are doing well. Actually, the point of collection is much smaller than the artifact that we see on the screen. But what the, uh, it, it, how it works? So if we click on uh, uh, one platform, I mean we have the different platform. We have uh, Argos, we have uh, uh, Moorings, uh, 
we have ships, uh, then we see the time series of the data that are being collected. So we make this data available to, I mean, uh, standard users that are not expert users. So just going to the system, you can click and see data. And you can see, again, data that are coming from citizen science initiative, like Ocean Race. So here I have taken one picture from the portal of uh, the Ocean Race, but you can also see the same track in uh, Immonet physics. And then if you click on, of course, on the line or, or the platform, you also see the data that are operationally collected. And this is a, an added value. So if, I mean, again, the value of the different play, uh, yes, players in, the, in this uh, game. Uh, um, Ocean Race is uh, um, engaged with OceanOps. OceanOps is engaged with the global ocean data sharing uh, things. We are connected to OceanOps, and so we receive the data. So the pipeline is working well, and so each and every one can consume this data. Then, of course, if we have more expert user, then we can also provide some further advanced uh, interfaces. For example, here you can see some example of uh, uh, AirDAP, that is one tool that we are offering as a central system in order to facilitate the interaction with the data. And, and here I'm saying data, 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 because we need data. <laughs> we talk about this since this morning. So here you can see that, for example, if you click, I mean, you can browse the, the, the data set, then you can find data, and we're, this is the ARISE <laughs> data. It's thanks to ARISE, we, we're receiving quite a lot of polar data. Then you can uh, uh, interact with one single data set, and then you can see the, I mean, single data collection from each cruise that has been done. And this is also important because somehow, as a mission, as Imonet, we need to improve the fairness. Fairness, what is meaning? Is uh, the facility to, um, according which we can access the data. And this is just uh, two movies in which I'm showing how easy it is to access data if you have, uh, I mean, again, following some of the common standards and common tools that we are setting up. I was showing uh, how easy it is to collect a time series from IRDAP. Here I'm showing uh, how easy it is to include this data into a Google sheet, a spreadsheet. So if you use a couple of commands, if you know the link, the connection URL to the data set, then you can easily play with tools and make a, a plot. So it's really facilitating uh, the access to data. It's fairness to my point. But we also say that we need to contribute. We, we are not alone. We need to other people to contribute. So it's a call to action. And so how to contribute? Uh, it was already mentioned. We have ingestion. It's the easiest way to do that. And the platform is working very well, especially with the delayed mode data. Because you go there, you are, I mean, instructed to, uh, in uh, some few steps, in order to commit your data and deliver and make them uh, available into this big uh, pocket, I would say, big uh, data lake. So you just go there and follow the instruction, and then you see it. But you can, if you're running operational system, I'm thinking about one of the next presentations that <laughs> we're going to have. Maybe we can also think about a more, let's say, machine-to-machine -machine connection to Imonet. So one example is to make a virtual links to a repository. We are speaking about federated system because, mm. we are, I mean, this morning was touched. We, don't, we cannot think of having one single database which is hosting all the data that we are uh, uh, producing. So we need to think about this federation. And one easy way to make a federation is to make connection with what is, I mean, running uh, platforms or running uh, programs. And one way to do that is, for example, install an RDAP server. And physics and ingestion are, have developed uh, some tools to do that. And together with the tools, we are also offering, as Imonet, the training and the support in order to deploy this kind of stuff. So again, it's a call to action, but we are also offering uh, the, let's say, the expertise in order to put them in place. So don't, don't forget about this, and please share this <laughs> across the community, because we are really uh, willing to help. And by doing this, then we implement also some of the metadata that was mentioned before, because in order to have a sustained, I mean, also reproducible results, we need to come to uh, agree on some standards on a common language. And of course, it's quite important, because if we do this, then we can also monitor the impact of the programs that we are doing. And uh, I mean, I, I guess that uh, Emanuela is going to show more about uh, the KPIs that OceanOps is implementing. So, one say, uh, one couple of last words is, uh, I mean, the thing is that 
Imonet has a mandate to support and engage stakeholders and communities. And for example, in case of physics, we are trying to do our best in order to involve, to support gliders networks, or we are also rising the level of importance of some citizens and communities. The fishing for vessel communities, for example, is an emerging network that likely is going to be taken up by uh, goose. But we are also working and supporting some uh, far, I mean, uh, the, some other communities like the Saturn Ocean Observing System in order to provide them the tools in order to host data and present the data. So it's a, a nice win-win this morning again. We said quite a lot of, of times. It's important to have a win-win approach in order to make this kind of available. And uh, the, ERISE, uh, the interaction, the memorandum of understanding with the ERISE is another, uh, another nice example. And we are going to have some presentation about this. Uh, because, because we have a common challenge, because we need to fulfill some of the directives that we have uh, at the European level, and uh, the mission restore our ocean and waters have been already mentioned several times. We are in the, the decade of ocean science, so again, we need to do this. We need to improve and boost the blue economy and the blue society, uh, I mean, empowerment in general. So if we do our job well, if we make it our data available, then we can really help, I mean, the commission, and ourselves. And so with this, I would like to close. <laughs> Thank you. Again, impressive from citizen science activities to uh, ingestion to, to really engaging a lot with uh, uh, the platforms to make sure that they are also acknowledged and that they are very present the products that you produce, and also your contributions to, to other communities, eh? because it's not only uh, providing access to data resources, but also expertise, knowledge, and tools, as you said. It's very impressive that the spatial data infrastructure, that you can uh, help other communities with that as well, in a win-win scenario. Yes, and absolutely. I think there is a, still a lot of leverage, I think, that you have to improve. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. That is a key, a key message, again, that we're learning from physics. Because I, I say it, I mean, somehow we are lucky because we are an easy, para, I mean, a, an easy collection of parameters, I would say, mm. because uh, they are less sensitive than others. So it's easier, and they, most of them are collected in real time. So it's also easier to come in an agreement with the people in order to connect them. And as these kind of parameters are also useful for many, kind of, uh, many applications in different domains, it's nice to see this kind of win win collaboration. So we need to keep I mean, enlarging our horizon, I would say, mm -hmm. in order to involve other people and let them to know which are the standards or the networks that we are already developed in order to try and make the best use or, I mean, uh, let's say, uh, move also other best practice from one field to the other. So we can learn, we can teach some things, mm -hmm. we offer the expertise on some things, mm -hmm. but we can also learn from other communities. And this is, again, what, quite important. So all the activities that we're doing together uh, around the engagement and the um, I mean, the support that we can provide are quite fundamental in order to, to improve the quality of data and the availability of data. Very good point. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Antonio. I'm going to look into the room to see if there are any burning questions for any of the three. Ah, we have one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Please, uh, Jenny. Can you yeah, indicate for who? Coming, it is coming, uh, the microphone is coming. Thank you. Uh, you need to switch on. Okay. It's yes. okay. Um, very, very nice presentation, the three of you. Um, and the question of trust in data and understanding of data comes up many, many times. And eModnet is addressing that. Trust comes in part from knowing the processes and methods for collecting the data and then also analyzing it or adjusting it. Do you actually connect your data and label it according to what process was used so people can not only know the data, but they know the methods of the best practices used? Well, this is a process that we are doing. Some uh, I mean, some lots are doing better than others, I would say, because, for example, in case of chemistry, this is very well mapped. We are a bit, uh, I mean, <laughs> following, I would say, but one point is, uh, yes, I mean, we are also informing the community about the, I mean, let's say, it's not more about the quality of the data, but informing which is the process that uh, has been used in order to collect the data, and which is the resolution of the sensor, because, again, uh, again, looking at the experience from physics, uh, uh, we saw that we may find use of the data that we are sharing in communities that we didn't know on, uh, before. So 
it's not correct somehow preventing them to use some of the data that you can may make available. But it's important to offer them the best quality of metadata in order to let them to do the process and understand if they can use or not the data. Then it's up to them to, to decide. But our job is to make data available with the, I mean, the best quality, of course, and the best metadata quality. <laughs> that is even more important as was stressed by, also by Alessandra. I don't know if you want, yeah. Yeah, I would just add, add to that then that in the metadata of um, each data file, like if you could click on a, a point data or download a data set, you would get that metadata not only of the owner, but the quality control and the process of how that data has been um, prepared. Um, some of the uh, email thematics are contributing their best practices into this international globe ocean best practice system that, that uh, I know you're uh, working within. Uh, we're looking to strengthen that as well. So I think that's something we could do you know, across all thematics to find uh, you know, best practices. Um, and then, yeah. One, one final word about best practice. I mean, in Imonet, I mean, some of data from different network uh, platform are coming. And somehow, we are also offering a sort of platform, again, in uh, metaphorical uh, terms, in which they can discuss about also the best practice uh, themselves. So, for, I, I mean, I, I didn't uh, cite it, but the case of HF Radar is, a, I mean, a champion example in which we started really from the, uh, let's say, regional application, and then we involved the community in order to sit down and discuss about the pre best practice. And nowadays, we have this data that is contributing to the global, let's say, uh, HF Radar uh, network, as well as the, the data that has been produced by the European node is serving Imonet, Copernicus, Sidatanet. So, we, I mean, Implemented the best practice, best practice uh, while doing the best, uh, best practice. I would say. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think. Yeah. Good. We have to. Yeah. Uh, one just one comment for the next speaker. Please stay in between the sofa because otherwise we buzz with the. <laughs> it's for the interference with yes, the microphone. With the... I've noticed. Thanks. Oh. oh Veronica, be careful. That's uh, and avoid <laughs> the <laughs> spotlights. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I got all your attention now, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Veronica. So, yeah, that brings us straight into the next uh, session. Uh, we'll be uh, looking a little bit more towards the, con the, the uh, observing activities and the sheep-based ones, and you will be speaking about Arctic Icebreaker Consortium. Aris? Arise. Arise. I, I, I was exercising the Italian Arice. Eh? Okay. <laughs> Sounds more romantic. Please, here you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, that was just to break the ice a bit. <laughs> um, so, yes, I'm going to talk. I need um, a remote. This here. So. Sorry. Press uh, which down. One? One? Yeah, that's Good. it. So. Um, yes, I'm going to. Hello? It works? Yes, okay. I'm going to talk about um, the need of, uh, of uh, data from uh, the Arctic region, especially. Um, Arrow okay, down, sorry. yes. Okay, so um, as you all know, uh, the Arctic Ocean or the Arctic region is warming at least four times faster than the rest of the world uh, due to climate change. And uh, one of the, perhaps one of the most dramatic um, effects of this uh, climate change in the Arctic Ocean is a decrease of sea ice. So the ice is becoming thinner. The ice is becoming thinner. Even more. <laughs> then you don't see the screen. <laughs> okay. The ice is becoming thinner uh, and, uh, and more mobile and also more difficult to predict. Uh, but this is not the only effect. Um, other effects uh, include um, the permafrost thaw, for example, thawing, um, as well very uh, strong ecological changes, invasive species, um, Arctic amplification, of, of course, water masses, what is happening with all the water masses, and as well is affecting the interactions between the ocean, sea ice, and the atmosphere. So there is uh, a strong need to uh, enhance the environmental data collection from the Arctic Ocean, um, to not only to address these research gaps, but also to, establi to establish baselines, and as well uh, to generate or to be able to generate uh, these projections for climate projections and weather forecasts, which are so much needed. 
So there, are, there have been several scientific uh, initiatives that have been taking place in the Arctic in the recent years. Um, for example, the Mosaic expedition with Paul Arsten being in the Arctic for a full year drifting with the ice, um, as well uh, as the Lansen Negacy or the Synoptic Arctic Survey with the um, simultaneous operation of several icebreakers to collect data in the Arctic Ocean. But those are actions that are actually punctual. They are only happening once and they are not repeated year after year. So we need to ensure that data collection in the Arctic Ocean is sustained and we have to think that on a long-term perspective, not only on punctual actions. But the fact is that uh, polar marine research is uh, technologically very challenging, is very cost intensive and uh, beyond the capacities of one single nation. So right now we have 21 research vessels, European research vessels, sorry, which are able to operate in the Arctic Ocean or around the Arctic Ocean let's say. So we have only three research icebreakers. Those are Paul Ashton uh, from Germany, Oden from Sweden, and Krompins Hakon from Norway. Seven ice classified vessels which can operate in good seasons on ice, let's say a spring or when the sea ice is not very strong. And then 11 vessels which operate only marginally to the, uh, to the ice zone. This is not a lot. In addition, due to the current political situation, we know that we have lost the access to half of the Arctic and also the, Russians, uh, uh, the Russian infrastructures. Um, on the other side, on America, we, of course, there are few uh, research icebreakers as well, mostly from the Coast Guard or a Sikuliak, which uh, is a research, uh, a research vessel. But we do not have that many platforms and there is a need to access. In addition, to access those research vessels is not so easy because they are nationally owned and of course they favor the access to the national um, scientists. So transnational access to these vessels so that scientists from countries which have strong product programs but do not own or operate an icebreaker is as well um, needed. Um, but in the Arctic Ocean, so we see that we do not have that many research vessels but Actually, in the recent years, the shipping in the Arctic has been increasing enormously. Due to the decrease of sea ice, actually, um, uh, there are a lot of, uh, of cargo vessels, tourist vessels, which have increased in this area. Would not be nice that all these vessels will be collecting data for us? <laughs> and I just leave this question. <laughs> so there is a need to ensure that the economic objectives are in balance with environmental protection. This is, this is something we always need to take into consideration. So it's in this context where the ARISE project um, was launched um, to uh, improve the capacities for marine-based research in the Arctic uh, Ocean. In this project, we have, uh, gave trans we have uh, given transnational access to six research icebreakers, not only from Europe, but also international research icebreakers. And we have implemented eight cruises, research cruises, um, in the Central Arctic and as well in the Canadian and Alaskan Arctic. Uh, we have contributed to the mosaic expedition by sending scientists to this, to this uh, polar stand drifting in the ice and as well contributed with three projects in the Synoptic Arctic Survey. So contributing to large scale initiatives. Um, in addition, we have established a cooperation with uh, Le Commandant Charcot from Ponant. This is a cruise vessel which is uh, actually is a PC2 class, so a very strong and powerful icebreaker, which has been constructed from the beginning to implement um, uh, scientific projects. They have laboratories, they have uh, water lines directly, uh, they have installed systems for detecting the thickness of the ice. It's, it's really very well equipped, and they are offering up to four scientists to join their cruises to implement projects. Um, uh, through Arise, we have offered, sorry, I think I have, can go back one. Yes, this is, for example, the cruises that were offered in 2022. They were implemented with uh, projects selected by Arise. Um, so we have implemented 10 projects in 2022, actually. Um, another call is being implemented right now in the Arctic, as well with 15 research projects. Uh, we launched a call for the Antarctic, which is currently uh, 15 proposals we recommended for implementation. And right now at this moment, we have opened a call to, for a transarctic cruise from Nome, Alaska Nome to uh, Longyearbyen. So this is a very fruitful collaboration, which is actually providing a lot of data. And the interesting about the collaboration with this um, company is that 
all those cruises are repeated. So they are doing several transects to the North Pole, they are doing several transects to, and this year after year, this is gonna provide quite an interesting uh, data sets for many, many parameters, which research vessels are not able to do. That's not possible. But of course, it's not only everything about collecting data. We are uh, collecting the data. We are actually here to talk about how to manage the data. So thanks to our collaboration with uh, Emonet and ETT, we implemented um, a map viewer and a metadata catalog to ensure that the data collected by Arise uh, cruises or Arise projects are really not lost and they are contributing to well-established data initiatives. Um, we are have implemented as well, in cooperation with CDataNet, a Polar Cruise Report database and a 3D icebreaker, which is more um, a visual uh, um, 3D model of, um, of a research icebreaker where you can access is so more, something more between didactic and, and useful for people that are gonna implement a cruise on one of the icebreakers. So with uh, this project, we made uh, a simplified access to these research icebreakers beyond national capacities to, for, to offer transnational access. Um, with a total of uh, 359 days at sea, we implemented the program of ships and plasma of opportunity with uh, Ponant on board Le Commandant Charcot. Uh, already implemented 127 days, but two more seasons are coming, so we will go beyond 500 days probably of uh, ship time. Um, we have contributed to large scale international initiatives through Mosaic and the Synoptic Active Survey. Training of new, new generations, we implemented a, a, a actually in on site, so on board. Uh, cruise for 20 scientists associated to the Mosaic School, so in the central Arctic. Um, a numerous uh, online trainings for technical skills and webinars. And we have as well contributed to the better management of the continuous flow of data to make sure that all this data in the Arctic is actually not lost. And since we believe, so the Arise project already ended, but we don't say it because we still continue to do this, mm. this platforms mm. of opportunity. But we truly believe that, that sharing infrastructures is crucial because not every country is able to operate and to maintain um, um, such expensive infrastructures. So we just submitted uh, in March a new proposal entitled Polarin, Polar Research Infrastructure Network. This is just a rise, but bigger. <laughs> um, uh, the idea is to share infrastructures, but everywhere and every kind of infrastructure. So <laughs> we will offer in both poles, so Arctic and Antarctic, in total, 38 research stations, 12 vessels, 18 observatories, four ice and sediment core repositories, and seven data infrastructures. So this is very, very, very ambitious with 50 partners. <laughs> so, but we still don't know if we are funded. We will know in July. So if you are funded, you will hear from us. <laughs> so the idea of uh, Polarin will be to integrate and combine the access to Arctic and Antarctic research infrastructures to improve online services, data access, and interoperability, with our main partner here being ETT, and uh, to ensure that the new generations are trained to explore the leading edge research infrastructures. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica, very interesting. Certainly something that I was uh, less uh, aware and familiar with. I have many questions, but I will keep them for afterwards. And um, also, for, for any questions for the audience, uh, as for the previous one, we'll take them at the end of uh, the lineup of this session. Thank you so much. And then I'm inviting um, Emanuela Rusciano. I hope I pronounced that well, Emanuela. Rusciano. So, oh, yeah. Rusciano. From Ocean Ops. Um, and Luciana will be uh, speaking to us on the Ocean Ops op um, activities and also on the voluntary ships of opportunity. Please, the floor is yours. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm part of o Ocean Ops. So Ocean Ops uh, is a joint center of uh, two United Nations agencies, the World Meteorological Organization and the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO which represents uh, two historical communities of uh, meteorologists uh, and oceanographers. As a joint center of these two UN agencies and communities, 
we play a crucial role in connecting them by supporting and expanding global network of uh, marine meteorology and oceanographic observations uh, at sea. So uh, I will start this presentation um, spending a few words uh, about why we observe the ocean and why the UN are uh, putting so much effort in uh, ocean observations. Uh, so the uh, ocean uh, plays a, a very important role in our climate system. It absorbs uh, uh, about 90% of uh, the excess heat and 26% of uh, anthropogenic carbon from the atmosphere every year mitigating the climate change, but at the same time, uh, it is uh, being affected by this uh, changing climate. The ocean is also important because it uh, controls our weather patterns, but climate changing uh, are intensifying extreme events, uh, such as uh, coastal inundation, marine heat waves, uh, severe storms, uh, and many communities, and especially the coastal communities, uh, are in the front line facing threats posed by changing ocean. And uh, all the life in the ocean, uh, like phytoplankton, uh, plants, uh, give us uh, the oxygen we drift uh, and the food we eat. But uh, some stressors like overfishing, climate change, and uh, increasing ocean pollution are putting these uh, vital natural services at risk. Uh, their impacts are still critical and observed. So, all the ocean services cannot be taken for granted, and the ocean observation are the foundation of our knowledge of the state of the ocean. And it is important to keep in mind that if we don't have data underpinning our decisions, we will not have a solution to monitor the ocean and for uh, climate change and global climate challenges. So, but uh, how we get this uh, important, uh, crucial ocean data? In 1991, the World Meteorological Organization and the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO have created a global ocean observing system. And since there, this uh, global ocean observing system has evolved towards an extensive global system of uh, instruments and ships at sea and satellites constantly observing the global ocean and the atmosphere above it to collect essential data that are used by scientists and experts around the world to study climate, improve weather forecast, deliver early warnings, and monitor the ocean health. So the in situ part of the Global Ocean Observing Situ today uh, is composed by about uh, 9,000 meteorological and oceanographic observing instruments and ships, uh, including uh, profiling floats, uh, drifting and uh, fixed buoys, uh, autonomous robots and piloted robots, uh, also marine mammals equipped with uh, uh, oceanographic instruments uh, and many others. And these instruments are all part of 13 global ocean observing networks, which are implemented by 84 countries in a global and collaborative effort to collect more than 100,000 daily observations of physical, biogeochemical, and biological variables for a vast range of applications, as we have seen. And if we look at the images here on the bottom of the, this slide, we can see that many instruments need uh, ships to be, deployed, to, to be deployed. So even in times of uh, uh, the increasing use of uh, autonomous uh, remote instruments, uh, without ships, most of the ocean observations uh, would not be possible. So ships are crucial for uh, many kinds of ocean observations. They are crucial to carry on board the weather station, collect water samples, but also to deploy, recover, and uh, make maintenance of the instruments at sea. And every month, more than 1,500 vessels, including research ships and voluntary ships, support the Global Ocean Observing System by taking observations uh, and transmitting their data. But the research ships uh, navigate in any oceanic region, but we don't have enough of these ships to collect Global Ocean data, and especially in any season. While voluntary ships are numerous, but uh, more than 90% of them follow regular uh, shipping lines, so leaving some uh, oceanic areas uh, underobserved. So this is why 
we need more ships today and uh, we need to, to, to as, I, uh, as I said before, we are in, in the era of climate ocean changes, so we need more data. To collect more data, we need to deploy more instruments. To deploy more instruments, we need more ships. So, and uh, we, it is also necessary to have uh, a deep insight in real time on all instruments at sea to identify the current and future ch challenges and gaps in the observing system. So we need to know which ship is at, a, at sea, when, what is its trajectory. We need to know the density, the coverage of the instruments at sea. We need to know, uh, to, we need to have information uh, on uh, uh, their, uh, the, the life expectancy of uh, all instruments. So we need to combine all this information to fill the, the gaps in the system. And this is one of the uh, services provided by OceanOps. So OceanOps for over 20 years uh, has been monitoring and coordinating all instruments and ships at sea in real time by monitoring and reporting on the status and value of the observing system to improve its performance and advocate for its development. We also uh, developed a web-based dashboard with a rich toolbox of maps, statistics, and metrics to help all implementers and the steering teams to analyze the trends in the system, identify gaps, uh, make decisions, uh, optimize the program efficiency. We also lead metadata and data exchange, harmonization, quality control, and integration across all global networks. We ensure that uh, metadata and data flow into global, international, uh, regional databases like the global telecommunication system of the World Meteorological Organization uh, and Imonet Physics, uh, for example. And we also support efficient uh, observing uh, deployment operation uh, at sea by facilitating these operations and providing recommendations on where and when to deploy instruments, for example. And we develop uh, innovative partnership with the civil society and private sector to support the GUS implementation. So on this last point, in 2021, OceanOps launched the UN Ocean Decade, Decade ODC project. Uh, the aim of this project is uh, to structure and recognize uh, all observing contributions from citizens, including surfers, divers, uh, uh, NGOs, um, fishing shipping companies, uh, um, so to um, collect these uh, contributions under a coordinated project. Every year we need to deploy at sea about two auton 200 autonomous buoys to guarantee the efficiency of the observing system. But uh, as we said before, these uh, instruments are often deployed by research vessels or, or voluntary ships uh, along a regular trajectory. So um, leaving some oceanic regions uh, like the Southern Ocean um, around Antarctica under observed. So the uh, contributions uh, and the partnerships uh, developed under uh, Odyssey help us to deploy instruments uh, outside of regular shipping lines, uh, fill critical observational gaps in the system uh, and ensure the sustainability of the observing networks. Uh. So many volunteers have already expressed their engagement with the Odyssey and the ocean race is uh, one great example. And so uh, I will conclude with uh, an open call addressed to all people here in the, in the room. So please uh, join this global effort to support ocean observation, whether you are a researcher, a citizen scientist, a uh, concerned citizen or policymaker, your involvement in ocean observation is very important. Through so sharing your data, getting involved in the Odyssey project, advocating for the importance of ocean observation, or strengthening your support. We can support the global ocean observing system in many ways, as we have seen. So you can play a critical role in implementing this system and protecting the ocean and the, the human life. So if you want to know uh, more about OceanOps and the Ocean Decade project, you can follow us at OceanOps underscore Goose on social media, or you can visit our website. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Very interesting overview and a very positive open call for support. Um, I very much uh, would like to know a bit more about the Odyssey project, so I'm definitely going to follow up and see how we can work together and collaborate. So that's uh, going to be very interesting, I think. Um, I had a question, but we'll see if we have time afterwards uh, to answer it. It's more related to the, the, the you mentioned the, the ships of opportunity. You need more. Uh, what is the bottleneck there? Is it the, the lack of uh, voluntary ships? Uh, if, you, if you have MERSC, for example, next week saying all our ships, please, do you have the capacity or is it a capacity problem? I mean, do you have these kind of questions? It would be interesting to know a bit more. Okay, then I see Simona Simoncelli is already uh, lining up for our next intervention together with Mattia Canevari from GNV. Uh, Simona, you are from INGV. Um, and you will be speaking a bit more on repeated uh, transect observations, XBT measurements and others. Um, and you have some examples of, of very long-term uh, transects that you've been monitoring and the importance of that. Please, yeah. Simona. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. I'm very happy of the previous presentation because they are settling uh, the scene uh, of this uh, uh, presentation, which is an example of repeated ocean temperature monitoring uh, uh, in the Ligurian and Tyrrhenian uh, Sea. This work uh, is in partnership with uh, Enea and GNV. Okay. So, um, the, one of the main mission of the Ship of Opportunity program of the Global o Ocean observing system is to uh, the, is the systematic collection of upper ocean uh, temperature profiles along repeated tracks using volunteering ships. In particular, uh, I will present uh, the, the tracks that are uh, um, conducted uh, releasing XVT uh, instruments. And uh, um, this is very important monitoring activity because this is contributing to check the uh, estimate of uh, global warming and especially of ocean warming, which is uh, the main indicator of climate change. Uh, you see in the map uh, that MX04, the Genova Palermo, uh, is a reference line uh, of the super XPT uh, lines uh, uh, global um, map. And uh, so this is very important because we know that the Mediterranean is an hot spot uh, for climate change and it has, it presents uh, the largest uh, uh, positive temperature trend uh, in the global ocean. Uh, so it is very important to continue this activity uh, which stopped uh, for a few years and INGV now sustains uh, this monitoring activity along this uh, Genova Palermo track on board of ROPAX uh, ships in the framework of MACMAC project, which is uh, funded by INGV. And uh, we involved uh, ENEA uh, as partner, but GNV uh, uh, as uh, you know, the, our uh, key partner because is. Uh, uh, pro giving us the opportunity to uh, stay on board and release uh, our instruments. We conducted eight uh, cruises uh, on seasonal basis up to now. We started again in 2021 uh, after a break of two years. And uh, in July 18th, it was the Andreth uh, cruise that was uh, uh, done. So it's a really uh, nice uh, result. These allow to extend a multi-year time series along this track uh, because uh, these activities started in 19, at the end of the last century thanks to a pioneering project which is MFSPP, Mediterranean Forecasting System pilot project and then through other different uh, European projects and the collaboration between different uh, Italian research institutes this activity gathered uh, many, many data, and we have the opportunity uh, to uh, first start uh, uh, analyzing the historical, uh, actually re-analyzing the historical uh, data set, uh, 
uh, something about uh, 3,800 uh, uh, XVT profiles. We are going to release a new version of it uh, because a partial version of these data are available in different blue data infrastructure, uh, European or American one. And uh, so we want to integrate all the available metadata that were not released at that time because they were not, uh, let's say, uh, important at that time, but now we know that every information is essential for reusing this data for different purposes. And uh, we also added a correction uh, thanks to a calibration system that was available, so we could add also this information. And uh, a new quality control procedure, automatic, was implemented in order, of course, at the status of the art of the late, last two decades of research in this field. And also the workflow is very important to speed up the process of sharing the data. This is the first uh, uh, result, a scientific outcome. It is a publication. Uh, it is an international team uh, led by uh, Li Jin Cheng, Professor Cheng, which is one of the most expert on ocean warming. And he is a lead author of the IPCC. And we presented, actually, in the last years, we, uh, we are presenting the, the latest estimate of ocean warming uh, of the previous year. And here uh, we have uh, the uh, warming stripes, uh, which uh, show very uh, nicely how the uh, Mediterranean is uh, uh, becoming hotter and hotter. Uh, and uh, you see, especially in the late 90s, uh, the temperature is uh, always increasing. Uh, so, and here on the side, uh, in specific, we put uh, the anomalies, temperature anomalies, uh, computed along the Genova-Palermo track, in which you can see how the intermediate waters that are below 200 meters and above 700, more or less, are uh, warming and warming. Uh, so it is very important to, to repeat uh, this monitoring activity at the seasonal uh, scale uh, in order to uh, really know uh, how the, the uh, ocean state is evolving. So, uh, of course, uh, we have uh, many uh, papers uh, ongoing, but uh, uh, we had uh, to implement, as I said, uh, the pipeline, and we wanted to add value to this data and share uh, in uh, real time. So, uh, we implemented this quality control uh, uh, automatic, and uh, we want to disseminate. So, we implemented the AirDAP server, this technology, uh, which allows us uh, to have machine-to-machine -machine access. In this way, we can share this data in Emotnet physics and also through the global, uh, through the GTS, uh, which is uh, uh, managed by the WMO. And uh, um, this, uh, is, this process is adhering to uh, meeting the requirements of the ocean and climate community, modeling communities, but also is adhering to the FAIR principles uh, uh, that are meant, as I said before, to facilitate uh, the data and metadata reuse for many purposes. So speeding up the generation of derived products as it is shown in this value, add value chain that goes from the observing system to the data ingestion to data infrastructure, then we can derive the first level products and then drive you know, reporting activities and also decision making and inform the policies uh, thanks uh, to uh, a rapid use of this data. So to conclude, uh, this is the image of the, our last uh, cruise, uh, the, tra the transit. Our activity uh, addresses both scientific and operational goal to contribute to sustain ocean observing system and rapidly provide reliable data for the uh, further use. But as said already, the sustainability of the activity uh, depends on the, the strategic partnership with the private sector and with the GNV uh, company uh, through a specific memorandum of agreement. So the engagement of the private sector is crucial to advance ocean knowledge and derive information policy and tackle the emergency 
the emerging uh, challenges. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to Ma uh, Mattia Canevari, which is uh, the energy manager of uh, GNV. Uh, and uh, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Uh, it's a great honor to be here representing GNV. And I think a few words about the project that uh, Monica uh, explicited very well. Uh, GMV is a part of MSC Group, uh, that it's a world leader in uh, passenger and freight transportation industry. GMV is uh, one of the most important shipping companies in the Mediterranean Sea, in particular. We have 25 ships that deployed in 20 commercial lines, and we have a presence in seven different countries. Um, I heard about uh, a lot of keywords today, um, but uh, to sum up, I think that uh, it's environmental sustainability. So uh, the link between uh, this project uh, with GMV, and uh, I'm honored to be here because uh, um, I can say that uh, uh, supporting a hosting on board uh, researchers and scientists of NVU and Enea, it's our role. So. Uh, it's important to give this help to the science. I, I heard about that analysis, I heard about big data. Uh, I think that uh, collecting data, sharing uh, uh, critical KPIs, uh, is crucial for the research and uh, it will be translated in uh, sea conservation. So uh, I think we are talking about uh, more than 100 campaigns. Uh, 20 years of collaboration, so uh, I can add only a thanks of Ingevu and Enea for this effort because uh, research is important, it's uh, the most important thing in order to analyze the continuously data and trying to make more conscious decisions in the future, I think. So. Um, I hope that uh, this collaboration could proceed in the future. Uh, we can count on us uh, today, but uh, also tomorrow. Our uh, ships uh, uh, along the route to Genoa Palermo are available for your uh, studies. Our, um, our crew supported you and will support you. And so thank you for the kind invitation. And uh, so have a nice day here in Genoa. Thank you. Thank you for, for joining as well and for uh, testifying on the, uh, the values of the collaborations also from you. From you. Uh, we heard a lot about public-private collaborations um, and this is something that we want to see more and more in the future. So uh, thanks a lot. It was very interesting. So in the interest of time, we're going to move forward. Um, we have a, a change in the program. The center will um, have um, uh, Stefan Raymond first from Ocean Race. Um, he's part of the scientific program of the Ocean Race, and uh, there are some interesting things to say about measurements and instruments that uh, some of the boats are rigged with. So we're very interested to, to hear about your testimony. Um, Petra Ten uh, we will have a video presentation from her, and we will make use of that time for everybody to listen in into the background, but we'll have our coffee break at the same time, so we can have our coffee listening, and uh, we can... Uh, pick up a little bit, recover a little bit of lost time, um, and I'm counting on all of the future speakers to uh, bear with time. Thank you. Please, Stefan. Yes, hello. Um, I try to make it quick, so I go through our science program, which I will present in the next uh, two, couple of minutes. Uh, we at the Ocean Race, we try to help our oceans by um, providing important... To downstairs. Yeah, you have to... Yeah. Oh yes, okay. Important uh, information. And we uh, created in a science program already in the year 2015. And this current program was shaped in the year 2017-18 with the last edition of the uh, former Volvo Ocean Race. And now it's called the Ocean Race. We have uh, six different elements in our science program. The first thing is we provide uh, meteorological data by using available uh, meteorological sensors which are already on board. The second thing is we deployed uh, surface drifters and Argo floats. 
during this edition, when we sailed on Lake 2 from Cap Verde Islands towards Cape Town, we deployed already four uh, surface turtles in the southern uh, um, Atlantic, and we deployed also one uh, Argo float. On the next leg from Cape Town to Itajai around Antarctica, we deployed 10 uh, uh, drifters, meaning two drifters by, by boat. Um, so that was the second element. The third element is we measure uh, essential ocean parameters like sea surface temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, and PCO2. So we equipped two boats with an underway system called Ocean Pack, and this instrument works 24-7, uh, pumping in water and uh, measuring those parameters. Here, for the first time, we added new elements to our program, so we sampled for trace elements, and also we had a first trial on an eDNA uh, sampler. I will talk about this a little bit later. The uh, fourth element is we equipped two boats with so-called um, microplastic samplers. Here we wanted to look uh, at, which, at what um, areas in the ocean we found uh, microplastic. This program had already um, established in 2017-18 where we found uh, microplastics in nearly all of our samples around the world. And we continue this program uh, in the edition uh, 2021, the European term. And now we have even a more um, um, extensive program to measure more samples. Oops. <laughs> so the fifth element is we had equipped one boat with an uh, automatic microscope. So we were looking for plankton, uh, mostly um, uh, phytoplankton. And this gives us some information about the carbon cycle. So these different elements of our science programs work together to form a nice picture about the health of the ocean. And lastly, we de, um, established for the first time a program to avoid collisions with marine macrofauna, especially whales and, and larks, fish like sharks. So we can't do this alone. We cooperate with um, um, well-known um, research organizations. Like this, we make sure that our data um, are in good hands. So to give you an example, we provide our data for PC2 to the GEOMA and the Max Planck uh, Society. We work together with Ocean Ops in, in uh, Plusané in France, also with the IFREMER, with the NOC and the uh, University of Rhode Island in the US. So you see we have a really international network of uh, experts, ocean experts. And this network makes sure that all data are in good hands, uh, that, that the data are uploaded in available databases, and um, that our data don't finish in a drawer and on a scene again. So here we have a look on the science equipment. As mentioned, we um, use available sensors on board to measure uh, barometric pressure, air temperature, wind speed, and so on. We provide those data to the GTS. Then we equipped two boats with this ocean pack, two boats with microplastic sampler, meaning we have a redundancy in our program. And we had, for the first time, this automatic microscope. Um, so this means we equipped all our boats with scientific equipment that ma makes the race equal. So there's no excuse anymore to say, no, we cannot take this extra weight uh, because uh, every boat is treated on the same way. Um, yes, to give you a fun fact, uh, we have five boats. It's a small research fleet, but we have the fastest <laughs> research fleet in the world. So 38.8 knots, I think it's unbeaten. When you go with the polar stand, you sail maybe with uh, five to 10 knots, 12 if you're very fast, uh, and we do it uh, carbon free. Also a nice fact. So um, how does it work? So we have um, 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 boats, what you can see here. Uh, I can maybe give you a tour if you have time later on. Um, we have a water inlet here at the keel of the boat at 2.8 meters, so we pump in water inside the boat where we placed our instruments. So depending on the team, we have the different instruments. So meaning we can have access to water 24 seven and sample all the time. So here to give you an example how our microplastic um, program works. So we had this uh, equipment on board. The sailors need to change this kind of filters. Here's a filter cascade where we pump water through and this takes about five minutes per day. So it's, it's doable especially in an audition where we sail with four people plus one um, online reporter. So this fifth per person has always the time 
to take care about our um, science equipment. All other equipment work more or less uh, autonomously. So the bottleneck of this program is not the capacity of the boat, it's more the uh, lab capacity which is needed behind. Um, so we were able to present first results from this, uh, from two legs, leg two, from uh, Cap Verde Islands to uh, Cape Town, and then leg three from Cape Town around Antarctica to Brazil. And what we have seen compared with the uh, data from the previous uh, race is that we have 10 to 18 times more microplastics in our samples, and also that we have found microplastics really in all our samples. This is um, quite remarkable. And we tried always to um, use innovative approaches. So here for the first time we used an eDNA sampling device. So we um, deployed those samples or we, we sampled waters on leg four from Brazil to uh, Newport. And the aim was to capture the diversity across the tree of life. So we used four different uh, genetic markers to, uh, to have a look in bacteria, phytoplankton, zooplankton, and fish and mammals. And here that's the online reporter, which changed um, these filters, um, or which uh, sampled every second day, as I, as I recall, uh, in triplets. And remember his face, because this becomes important. No, other way. So here when we look at the marker using, or lo having a look on fish and, and mammals, so we can go on the species levels and we see um, the abundance of life uh, we find in the water. And what we also see is here homo sapiens, meaning when Amory, that's the honor reporter, sampled, um, he touched slightly the filters. So this gives you an idea how, how sensitive our message is. And uh, lastly, um, our race is also very useful to make uh, research visible for the greater public. So we, we created a uh, website called theoceanracescience.com. And here you can get really basic information what we do and why we do it and where are our partners. You find also explanatory videos about our science program. And um, you will also see very soon results from microplastic analysis and um, or to plankton measurements. Thank you. Fascinating. Does anyone have a question for Stefan? Because we have the honor and pleasure of having you, so I think we, we should seize the opportunity, please. Yes, you first. <laughs> Well, in the first place, congratulations, excellent presentation. And one of the things which is curious, that uh, two, two questions in one question. 20% of the plastic or microplastic is at the surface. 80% we don't know where it is. Probably because the uh, Newton is going down and we don't have any idea exactly what happened. I guess what you are measuring, of course, is the 20% of the surface. And what I am surprised is normally these uh, plastic or microplastic are deployed by the rivers all over the planet. But you find everywhere. Yeah, since uh, due to ocean currents, plastic is dis distributed quite well around the ocean. And um, what I mentioned before, the 10 to 18 times more plastic we found in the ocean might have two reasons. First thing is we pollute every year more, uh, or three reasons. Second reason is that microplastic it's degraded down to microplastics, so we have more particles, not per volume, but per, per, per number. And third reason, and more, more important reason, is we have a much better methodology compared with four years ago. It's like when the first, uh, to calculate how many stars you find in the ocean, yeah. looking with naked eyes, and then we have, have uh, telescopes. So our method is developing more and more. So we have a much better look and uh, vision where we find plastic particles. But yes, due to ocean currents, you can find no. it really everywhere. And the other very fast question is, you talk about eDNA. Are you uh, sampling uh, and measuring already onboard ships, the eDNA? Because you take samples from the water and then you analyze it there, or you analyze through some optical system, the eDNA? Um, so I'm not an expert for this, but I can tell you what we did. Uh, so we had the special uh, filters. We connect these filters to our underway system, we uh, 
uh, filtered three liters or two and a half liters of uh, seawater. And um, the uh, novel thing about this filter technique was that we don't need an extra um, uh, preservatory. So we can simply, by drying it, store it for a couple of weeks, uh, shipping it to a lab, and they make the extraction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really fantastic. Um, OK. Then uh, if you have more questions for Stefan, we can grab yeah. him uh, now. The coffee break is around. Um, so we will have a video now. But if I am correct, we, you can one by one go for a coffee and a drink as you uh, need refreshments or a little bit of caffeine or teine. Uh, feel free to do. Not maybe all at once, but uh, smaller groups. And uh, so we will have Petra van Hope. Um, from the Southern Ocean uh, Observing uh, Community My name is and the uh, British Antarctic Survey. I am a scientific survey. data manager Please. at the UK yeah. Polar Data Center at the British Antarctic Survey and chair of the SUS Data Management Subcommittee that I represent here today. In my short presentation, I will briefly introduce the SUS data systems and their value. SUS stands for the Southern Ocean Observing System and represents an international network of stakeholders and contributors that have common interest in enhancing sustained, integrated, and multidisciplinary observations of the Southern Ocean in order to better understand the state and variability of the Southern Ocean and its cryosphere, circulation, air sea ice fluxes, biogeochemical cycles, and the Southern Ocean ecosystems. Observations of the Southern Ocean are carried out using a broad spectrum of in situ and remote sensors. And SUS has established regional working groups that develop, coordinate, and implement the observing system in their defined region. The regions align with the natural area of focus of nations involved in Southern Ocean activities although some activities will be coordinated at a circumpolar scale. Part of the SUS mission is to ensure the management and delivery of observational data, and SUS has therefore established a data management subcommittee to connect data repositories, rescue and publish data, and develop data discovery and coordination tools that bring together activities of the SUS community enhance coordination of observing capabilities and support principles of fair data, thus findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. I will return to this point later and will now very briefly introduce SUS data tools currently available to the Southern Ocean community. The most used system is the SUS map, a map-based data portal developed for SUS by the Emotnet Physics team with support of SOCIC project. It enables access to highly curated and standardized data sets that are being provided by a large number of data resources across multitude of scientific disciplines. The latest version of the portal now provides access to over 50,000 individual data sets and is designed to be used for polar data discoveries, identification of gaps in observations, or as an educational tool for a new generation of polar scientists. I will now very briefly introduce only a few main functionalities of the portal. SUSMAP allows users to select a map base layer from the left-hand side of the screen and to select data from a matrix of data platforms and data types on the right-hand side of the screen. Available selected data sets are presented as uh, data cards, where multiple cards can be activated and further data selection refined on parameters such as time or depth. Users can also explore gridded data products or view data profiles and download data of the available parameters in the data format they prefer to work with. The portal is well suited 
for standardized high quality data. However, not all data are available in a highly standardized format. Data sets that are, have a limited curation where data standardization has not been fully adopted can still be discovered using the SUS metadata portal. The portal is hosted by NASA Global Change Master Directory. It's optimized to show records that are related to the SUS candidate essential ocean variables and overlap the geographic area of 40 degrees south. It shows SUS relevant records as a subset from the International Directory Network. The portal has recently been redesigned and most metadata records include direct links to data. Another SUS product is uh, Due South. It's a database of upcoming expeditions to the Southern Ocean, developed for SUS by the Australian Antarctic Data Center. It is now maintained by the European Polar Board and integrated into the Polartex, which is a database of logistics information. This platform enables the community to share planned expeditions, observational projects, and logistics. Currently, the platform provides information on upcoming research vessel expeditions, flights, fishing vessel plans, and also touristic cruises. The golden standard is to have open and fair data in trusted repositories. This means that uh, data are open to everyone. They can be found, accessed, they can be integrated with other data, and they can be reused. The best way to ensure the data are fair is to consider all aspects of data life cycle. This means that data collection should be properly funded and well planned. Appropriate methods should be applied to data analysis and data storage. And the final data should be published in a trusted repository. A trustworthy repositories are those that are transparent about their operations, responsible for ensuring the authenticity and integrity of their data holdings. Trusted repositories are user-focused, uh, they, are pre, uh, they preserve data holdings for a long term and provide a reliable infrastructure for their, uh, for their services. The SUS map that I have introduced to you today presents fair data from trusted repositories. So why, it is, why is it important to have fair data products in a trusted repository? There are a number of reasons, but just to mention a few. This enables us to view data in context of other data. For example, align old and new data and compare them in order to build new hypotheses and promote new research. This makes data readable also to machines and usable for artificial intelligence to train data models to analyze data and recognize patterns. This enables us also to discover and gaps in observations and work on strategies to close these gaps. Another advantage of open and fair data products in trusted repository is that this facilitates development of mobile data from multiple contributors. So the data are not dependent on one infrastructure and one provider. And finally, Fire data products from trusted repositories will also be essential connection between in situ observations, digital infrastructures, and so called digital twins of the oceans. A digital twin of the ocean is a promising concept. It's a dynamic virtual copy of a physical asset, sometimes also called avatar. An avatar will need a long lasting, standardized, and interoperable, interoperable data products so that the avatar can collect data, get an input from data products, make decision and guide it itself to collect new data, all in automated way without manual intervention. And on that note, I would like to thank all our contributors who are bringing the SUS data products to life and thank you for your attention.
Just ask them to come back in. Can I ask everyone? Uh, can I ask everyone to take their drinks? Come back to your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready for the next session. And Jay will have uh, sing us a song. <laughs> ah, good, good. Yes, no, no, but uh, we we have enough time. We're among friends. All right. Can I ask everybody to take their glass and uh, join us back? Can I ask Andrew already to uh, come to the stage? So, can I ask everybody to come back, please? We will uh, move into our next session. We have two more speakers before our round table. I will start calling names, Taco, Juanjo. Simona, Monica, if I'm correct. <laughs> Can I please ask everybody to come back? We have um, two more talks before the round table. We are now going to... Um, look uh, a bit more in specific effects and impacts um, in particular regions as melting um, and as well the green uh, green on climate change uh, sorry on sea level rise speaker andrew if i can uh, invite you to the stage and you have the microphone here Are we ready with the slide deck? Excellent. Here we go. Andrew. OK, well, thanks for having me back. I didn't realize I'd be speaking to the same group of people, so you might <laughs> uh, see me skip over a few <laughs> slides. Um, but I'm talking specifically today about a Horizon Europe project that I have. Uh, uh, this is called Ocean Ice. Uh, this is, and specifically, it's, it's the ocean cryosphere exchanges in Antarctica, the impacts on the climate and the Earth system. Um, Come on. There we go. Right, so you saw this before, but now there's green land, so we have the local interest. Um, so yeah, as we know, the ice sheets are thinning quite dramatically. Uh, around, so at the moment, uh, Greenland has, you can see around the coastline there, uh, that red colour. There's a very rapid ch uh, change in the ice sheet thickness. 
Um, and the same thing is happening around Antarctica. It's mainly concentrated in the West Antarctic Peninsula. And the reason for it being these coastally focused red areas is because that this loss of ice is being driven primarily by the ocean. Uh, heat is being delivered to the base of the ice sheets and particularly the floating ice shelves and that's driving uh, increased basal melt, so melting at the bottom of these floating ice sheets and increased carving, so the, uh, the front of the ice sheets carving off into icebergs. Um, and these are positive feedbacks. As you, as you melt these uh, ice sheets, uh, ice shelves rather, uh, they reduce the amount of buttressing and all the glaciers sitting on the land behind them accelerate their flow into the sea. And so this is a process that we've been seeing over the last 20 or so years or longer, um, but increasingly clearly with satellite altimetry. Uh, and it's being very much driven by the ocean. So we really need to understand this ice-ocean interaction if we're going to understand the impacts on sea level rise. <clears throat> and these ice sheets contain literally 100 metres of sea level rise inside them. Obviously that's thousands of years worth of melt, um, but they have the potential for quite rapid changes. And these, uh, the potential for ice shelf or ice sheet collapse, even in relatively small areas, is something that is really unknown and presently unaccounted for when we talk about uh, climate change. So this is that plot I showed before, and that dashed line at the top there is really this low likelihood, high impact storyline. So that's talking about <coughs> what happens if our understanding of the ice shelves or ice sheets is uh, imprecise. So things like marine ice cliff instability, once you start losing some of that ice, and you, does that progressively speed up uh, ice, losses of the ice shelf and ice sheet behind it? Uh, and, and what are the knock-on effects of that? So these low likelihood but very high impact storylines uh, were basically drawn together under the last a uh, IPCC report. Uh, and they were done not in a particularly uh, rigorous way in comparison to these other lines. All the other lines are the output of numerical models. They're based on fundamental physics that we understand quite well. Uh, there's obviously bits that are missing or parameterized, but they're all inside models and there's 30 or so contributing modeling groups that are working out exactly uh, to build in that sort of uncertainty bar. So we're fairly confident that that's what the oceans will be doing, but we don't understand very well what the impacts, what the feedbacks between the ocean and the ice sheets will be. Uh, which reads this dashed line. And if you look at some of the other documents associated with this, depending, some experts say it could be up to 14 metres, which would obviously be utterly catastrophic for coastal, uh, coastal regions. And the other thing that we don't understand is these feedbacks between the ocean and the ice sheet. They don't act alone. <clears throat> you can't just say, OK, well, let's make the ice sheet melt some more in our models and that'll fix it, because they interact with one another. On the left, you see uh, an experiment where they've taken one of these climate models <coughs> and run it forward 100 years under the normal sort of forcing scenarios, but they've added in uh, melt. So they've said, we, we estimate there'll be this much melt from the Antarctic ice sheet, and they've just dumped that fresh water into the ocean. And what you can see here, this is the map of the temperature change uh, compared to a model without this extra freshwater forcing. And you see that the, actually the entire globe is somewhat cooler. And so that's the effect of basically adding a whole heap of cold, fresh water to the ocean. You actually get slightly less global uh, surface temperature change. But on the right, what you see there is this is the map of the change in temperature uh, at 400 metres under the surface around Antarctica. And what you see there, and at 400 metres down, this is where you have a massive increase, so 2.5 degrees. It doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a, that's a huge increase in heat, more, uh, more than doubling of heat in those layers uh, around Antarctica. And 400 metres is exactly where the ocean really interacts with the base of these ice shelves. So what that represents is a really a massive potential positive feedback because this model, it just added the fresh water in. What the ocean did didn't affect how much fresh water went in. But in, a real, in the real world, as that, as that fresh water comes in, it, it traps heat in the subsurface, and that heat then interacts with the base of the ice shelves, which potentially leads to a positive feedback and an acceleration of this ice sheet melt. Uh, and this is not a linear process. It's incredibly non-linear. Uh, and so what that leads to is potential for climate tipping points. So tipping points have been somewhat in the news uh, of late. So this is a paper that came out last year that talked about numerous global tipping points. And you can see that many of them are actually associated with the polar regions. We have several in Antarctica. Um, so the West Antarctic uh, ice sheet. So we've got a laser. Nope, no laser. But the West Antarctic ice sheet, you can see uh, the potential for collapse could actually occur with less than two degrees of global warming temperature change. Some of these other ones are somewhat more robust, where you need, might need four degrees to change the East Antarctic ice sheet, for example. But two degrees feels worryingly close. 
And that could potentially, adding all that fresh water, changes the ocean circulation, which could change the, Ant Anti sorry, the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, which could mm -hmm. feed back. And so this is a, a very complex global system uh, and highly nonlinear, which is presently not modelled. So these are some of the problems that we wanted to explore in ocean ice. And, um, and we're not working in isolation here. There's already numerous existing projects within the uh, European Horizon Framework mm -hmm. uh, that, are contrib that are looking at different aspects of these. So, for example, Protect in the bottom left looks at sea level rise, and um, TIPAX is looking at tipping points. SOCHIC, which you'll hear from next, uh, is looking at ocean heat and carbon. So bringing all these together is the aim of ocean ice. So this is a uh, 8 million euro program uh, that's co-funded by Horizon Europe and the, U and the United Kingdom Research and Innovation. Uh, it started back in November last year and is carrying on for another four or so years. It involves 17 centres across the EU and UK uh, and with many, many in participating international partners who really support a lot of our field work. So very quickly what we're looking at, we're looking at uh, here we are, the interaction of the subpolar, uh, subpolar ocean around Antarctica and how that actually delivers heat to the ice shelves and how those dynamics uh, change. Then how the ice shelves, this melting around the periphery, impacts the wider ice sheet and how that can accelerate uh, mass loss. And then running that forward uh, right, right through to beyond 2100, which is the traditional time horizon, out to 2300, which is really the sort of time th timelines you're talking about with these very large ice shell sheets. And very rig an important part there is really rigorously trying to define our levels of uncertainty so we have a good knowledge of what we do know, what we expect, and what we don't know. Uh, and then looking at how this will change ocean circulation. So really looking at particularly how this will change the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation and how it will uh, interact with changes in the circulation driven by melt in Greenland. So this is the, the, sort of the two limbs of this overturning circulation. And then, final, uh, then t taking this forward and looking at how this changes in ice sheet, ocean circulation actually impact on the climate. The metrics we care about, things like sea level rise, global mean surface temperature, ocean heat content. And finally, feeding that through uh, to climate assessments, things like the IPCC, uh, in, uh, model, uh, model into comparison projects, and feeding this through to policymakers and the public. So we're going to produce these new projections of sea level rise, new assessments of tipping point risks, uh, a bunch of new observations for things like this uh, autosub directly underneath the ice shelves. Um, and we'll make the first projections of these climate, global climate indicators uh, from properly fully coupled ice sheet ocean climate models, uh, which had probably previously been the area of educated guesswork. Uh, and so finally, this is direct collaboration with regional models and policymakers to try and bring these global metrics down to a scale where it's useful for long-term planning, things like um, coastal engineering and so on, and to make it useful uh, for, uh, well, for, <laughs> for the people who live on the coast in Europe. So there we are, um, all the usual uh, places to find us on social media and our many collaborators. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Very interesting. You already partly answered it uh, because it, uh, um, it, it brings together European project clustering a little bit, mm -hmm. but you also mentioned collaboration, obviously, with international partners, which I can imagine in this kind of research is essential. Can you give a little bit information as to how intense and how they are involved and how do you make sure that you... Sure. So there's some direct collaborations and direct financial collaboration for, with groups like SUS, the Southern Ocean Observing System. So this is an international body, uh, much like the Global Ocean Observing System, specialised in the Southern Ocean. Uh, so we're working with ETT, who is actually bringing, adding a new data layer to their, uh, their Southern Ocean map. Um, so we're providing funding to support that and directly working with SUS. Uh, but in terms of other direct collaboration, we're working with the Australians, the South Africans, New Zealanders, uh, Koreans, and, and Germans uh, as well to support the observations around the continent. And, and this is something that Veronica touched on. It's very, very hard to get uh, ship time funded under these sorts of pro uh, projects, mm -hmm. which is a massive limitation on ambition. So you really have to rely on ships that are already going to places that aren't necessarily the way you exactly want to go mm -hmm. and making the best of it. Um, so we have lots of, uh, more, uh, lots of mooring deployments and float deployments uh, and being supported by these other nations, which we're immensely thankful for. But an integrated framework would be immensely useful for really targeting and raising the level of ambition of these sorts of projects. Yes. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Are there any questions, quick questions from the audience? Please, Juan, quick.
While you talk about the ice sheet, you talk about the iceberg and glaciers in Greenland. The question is, is it true that each glacier or each ice sheet has their own or its own ADNA or something like that? So the melting is not something that happened exactly at the same time everywhere, but depend on the age, on the well, special properties of each uh, ice uh, uh, sheet or glaciers. Yeah, so v melting is really regional in how it works. So I'm, I'm not an ice sheet person, I'm an oceanographer, but I've <laughs> spent a lot of time with them. Um, so you do have these sort of large-scale forcings, changes in the atmospheric temperature, changes in precipitation, and changes in the ocean temperature. But each individual glacier and ice shelf has its own unique geometry, uh, and it really depends on the axis, in the ocean melting case, it really depends on the axis of this warm water to the base of the ice shelf. So, for example, the reason you saw that uh, enhanced melt on the West Antarctic Peninsula, but not anywhere else around Antarctica, is really because that's where this Antarctic circumpolar current with this huge volume of warm water is actually directly accessing the ice shelves and is directly influenced by changes in the winds. Other areas like the Weddell Sea is very, very well insulated from immediate changes and with, from climate models with or regional models, it takes about 100 years of, of strong climate forcing to effectively burn through that protection the local geometry in, uh, allows it. And then at about 100 years, or it varies by uh, ice shelf, it starts melting and you see it kick off very quickly. So at the end of the day means that when melting happens in glaciers or in ice sheet or in Antarctica, it's not uh, related with the phenomena which is occurring right now. It's a process happening across the time, no? Yes and no. In some cases, it can be phenomena that happens right now. Um, so wind changes are one way of directly changing the ocean circulation and bringing warm water that was previously not in contact with the ice shelves directly into contact and can rapidly change melting. But you are right. I mean, this is, they, they can be very long-term phenomena. So the West Antarctic one, for example, you can look back into the 1940s and you can see that ungroundings happened in those times as well. So that's, that is... There is very multiple time frames involved sitting on top of one another, and disentangling them is, is really the work of modelers, I think. Observations don't have the resolution to do Thank it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Andrew. And um, now we're, gonna, we're going to have a, a short um, intervention um, from Jean Baptiste uh, Salé, and he's joining us remotely. Hi, everyone. Thank uh, you for bearing with us. And uh, yes, we can see your presentation now perfectly. Please, go ahead. So <clears throat> I'll try to talk briefly on a, on a project called SOCHIC, which is a, a similar size project as Ocean Ice, um, uh, gathering 16 different partners across Europe and South Africa. And I'm, I'm the scientific coordinator of SOCHIC. Um, so she extends for Southern Ocean Carbon Heat Impact on Climate, and so we are trying, really trying to uh, to um, understand uh, how uh, Southern Ocean is impacting climate uh, uh, as a whole. Uh, so I'll, I'll spend this uh, a few minutes with you, trying to convince you uh, that we uh, need to understand the Southern Ocean and we need to observe the Southern Ocean. If you are not already convinced by uh, Andrew's very nice talk. <clears throat> so, as you probably all know, uh, the Earth has been warming at a very uh, rapid rate in the past century, uh, unprecedented in the in the in at least the, the last two thousand years. But what we, you really have to understand is is that this warming, uh, which is associated with extreme events and and that we can feel in our daily life, is actually only the tip of the iceberg. It only represents barely one percent of the Earth's uh, heat increase. Most of it actually occurs in the oceans. Nine, more than 90% of the heat accumulation on Earth occurs uh, below the ocean surface. And that's not, uh, that's in particular, uh, that's in particularly true uh, in the Southern Ocean. The Southern Ocean is responsible for uh, more than three quarters of, of all the heat that enter the global oceans. Uh, in all, it's also a key uh, uh, door for absorbing a carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and 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 storing it in the deep seas half of the of the ocean carbon uh, anthropogenic carbon uh, enters the global ocean through the southern ocean and the reason why the southern ocean has a, such an important place uh, it's because it's actually a keystone of the global ocean circulation and i like to to show this 
this map, uh, slightly distorted map of the world uh, in, in what we call the Spielhaus projection, which I really like because it, it's, it plays the Southern Ocean where it should be at the center of the global ocean, creating a link between the different ocean basins and also a link between the different layers of the ocean, the, the upper ocean and the deep ocean, creating, uh, making it able to absorb and extract climate signal uh, from the atmosphere and store it in the deep seas. So Southern Ocean really uh, uh, give us a crucial service to our daily life. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to, to show a, few, uh, a bit more numbers. So it's a uh, Southern Ocean carbon sink represent 0.8 petagram of carbon per year uh, that it extracts from the atmosphere to store in the deep seas. You probably don't, uh, uh, doesn't tell you much if I give you a number like that, but just for comparison, uh, that's about twice as efficient as removing carbon with the Amazon rainforest. So don't take me wrong, I'm not saying that we shouldn't care about the Amazon uh, forest, but I, uh, I'm just saying that uh, we should definitely care about what's going on in the Southern Ocean. The problem is that the service that the Southern Ocean uh, provides us with uh, comes at a very high cost. Uh, Southern Ocean suffer from that. Uh, with deep, deep uh, reaching warming, uh, when we look at depth, uh, the, the Southern Ocean is the ocean that warms most. Uh, uh, up to uh, the, the abysses, uh, we see the fingerprints of human activities and, and ocean warming. This uh, warming is associated with uh, feedback uh, that can be climate feedback through uh, clouds cover, for instance, which directly impact uh, global warming or uh, feedback with the ice shelf melt, as Andrew already mentioned, uh, uh, the, the ocean warming being able to, to melt the ice shelves, accelerate the flow of the ice sheet and, and, and drive sea level rise. <clears throat> there is also other aspect uh, rapidly changing in, this, in the Southern Ocean. Uh, you might have heard that the, the, the sea ice cover been fairly stable over the past 40 years, slightly maybe increasing its cover, but over the past 10 years, it's been rapidly declining. Um, and actu actually, when you look at the, the, the cover of, of today, uh, here I'm showing the, the, the seasonal anomaly. So in, in the x-axis, you've got the month, uh, y-axis, the, the anomaly of cover uh, for, for, for different years that the different lines and the, the red line is to 2023. Uh, today is the, the dot. Uh, you see that <clears throat> a, few, a few days ago, uh, you see a, 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 a complete uh, um, a loss, or not loss, but a, a very strong decline, uh, uh, unprecedented of the sea ice cover. So we really must understand what's going on in this part of the world uh, because uh, this can have uh, large uh, climate impacts. The problem when we try to understand what's going on is the observations. Here I'm showing uh, two maps showing the observation density in color. Uh, on the left, you've got uh, all the observation uh, since the 19, uh, 1970 um, that's been taken from ship uh, research, uh, research ship uh, uh, observations. Um, I'm showing here physics observation, temperature, salinity, and pressure. Uh, and you see uh, um, almost uh, very uh, large asymmetry uh, between the, the hemisphere with a, 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 um, a lack of observation in the southern hemisphere. The Argo program, uh, you might have heard about it, uh, uh, completely changed the game of oceanography uh, from, the, the, from the year 2000s, but, but even the Argo program uh, struggle uh, in, in, the, in the southern ocean close to Antarctica where you've got the sea ice cover, and so you've got challenges for observation there. So in Sochik, we try to, uh, to, to solve that gap by uh, really uh, pushing the limit of observations, uh, looking at specific processes with different tools, um, autonomous tools to really target the understanding of key processes and try to extract their climate impact by combining this observation with a numerical approach. <clears throat> so what do we do with these observations? So that's uh, one, pay, one example of result that we got for in, in Sochik uh, using historical observations and, and in new observations as well. We look at, we, we, I'm showing here the change uh, over the past 60 years of salinity 
uh, at the at the uh, in the surface layer of the solar nation, and you see a freshening trend uh, that is the result of uh, release of fresh water from from the ice sheet and also from increased precipitation in this part of the world. The problem of of uh, of, lose, of of decreasing the salinity in the upper ocean it's a bit like adding a fresh water on top of oil. You start decoupling the surface layer and the deep ocean, and so you you it, it, it making the ocean more stagnant, uh, and it's more it's dif more difficult to uh, to uh, to pump climate signal from the atmosphere to storage in the deep seas. This increased stability of the sun nation, we measure it. That's another example of result we got from this from the project. Um, we we measure it. So I'm not. I, I won't go into detail of, of this figure on the right. But basically, we've got a very strong increased stability of the operation uh, of the sun nation. And so, as you increase the stability, you start struggling to uh, to uh, to 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 drive the, 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 the surface to deep uh, circulation, what we call the Antarctic overturning circulation. And that's a paper from our colleagues in Australia, that's not from Sochik, um, <clears throat> that's a project, uh, a decline by more than 40% uh, in a few decades of this uh, 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 climate uh, uh, important circulation. We also see that from observation, uh, that's a, a result uh, from a, a collaboration between Soshig and Ocean Ice, um, where we looked at the, the volume of, of bottom water uh, in the Weddell Sea, and we see a, a strong decline of this bottom water volume uh, in the Weddell Sea, uh, which is um, uh, uh, which is possibly associated with, with natural variability, but with processes similar to what I have just told you about. Now, as you reduce the overturning circulation, uh, you, you warm uh, the, the deep ocean. Uh, uh, Andrew, Andrew already uh, told you a little bit about it. Uh, and that's what we observe when we use uh, repeat observations uh, across a, a section uh, 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 crossing the Southern Ocean. We see that in the red box here, I am showing the, a slight warming, but this warming is actually uh, very large compared to internal variability and can have a strong impact on the ice uh, sitting around this, this bit of ocean, so sea ice and ice sheets. So uh, as uh, Andrew already mentioned, uh, you can start having reinforcing feedback between melt of the ice sheet, which warm the, the ocean, and, and the ocean warming, uh, increasing the melt of the ice sheet. Uh, and as you reduce, uh, when you increase the stability of the of the of the ocean, you you start struggling to uh, to to take up more carbon, uh, to and, and store it in the deep seas. And that's that's what this uh, this result from our colleagues, uh, that's not part of Sochi here, but that's exactly what they find. Um, as you uh, again, I'm not going in the detail of the figure, but basically what it tells you is that as you reduce the overturning circulation, you start storing less carbon. Now this model, uh, we know they are not perfect in terms of process uh, representation for carbon uptake. And so that's why we are trying to uh, improve in SOCHIC. So uh, really try to investigate the key processes that drive carbon uptake, uh, air flux and, and injection in the deep ocean. And we do that uh, using different tools. Here, yeah, that's one example of a, of a nice result uh, from SOCHIC where we look at the, the storm impact on the carbon uptake. And uh, again, you know, a few examples of different toys we use to really target specific processes uh, that are important for heat and carbon uh, uh, fluxes across the sea surface. And here, yeah, a few examples of cruises that we've uh, done in the past uh, uh, years. So I'll, I'll stop here. Um, uh, in conclusion, so you've got a few uh, links here if you want to know more about Sochik, or you can also ask me questions. Be very happy to uh, address them. Uh, but in, in summary, uh, South Notion is remote. Uh, it's definitely under observed. We need more observation in this part of the world because it does shape uh, our daily lives. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Jean Baptiste, uh, for joining us from. Uh, from Paris, from Sorbonne, I suppose you are there. And for, for yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, some very disturbing uh, trends and observations, but also the main message that there is still a lot of work 
to do to fill the gaps in observation um, and under sampling. So thanks a lot. In the interest of time, I, I would ask you to keep with us because what I'm going to do now is going to invite the, um, the roundtable speakers to the front, but I will also ask all of the speakers of the previous sessions to remain ready so that we will do uh, a round of questions with the roundtable speakers and um, then open the floor also for questions from the floor to any of the speakers you would like if you have any questions. So um, the final um, roundtable discussion, we invite Mario Dogliani, um, who um, is from SDG for Med and the Fondation Philippe Cousteau, and I hope you will explain and say a few words about that. Uh, right away, Taco de Bruin from IODE, who has spoken this morning, the International Oceanographic Data and Information Exchange in the Netherlands. Um, and we have, uh, normally, we should have with us Remy Denos, who uh, uh, spoke um, earlier uh, and gave an introduction. And I hope that you, Taco, and, and, and Remy have been able to listen into some of the talks and reflect a little bit more as well maybe some new insights or, or points you want to, to, uh, to share, as we will be talking about the importance of marine data and information um, and knowledge on European policies. And then we have, of course, Remy um, and also Mario to, uh, to help with that and uh, addressing global challenges. And I hope, um, Taco, you can also shed some light on, on how these efforts at European level can contribute and be leveraged um, at the global level. So. Um, I will start with you, Mario, if, um, if I may. We had some discussion prior to, uh, to the meeting. Um, you, you, you were chairing yesterday, if I understand correctly, uh, um, with the Commission on uh, Mission Restore Our Oceans and Water. And I think Deputy Director General Kestutis already referred to it this morning. We'd like to, to invite you also, reflecting a bit on the topic of today, some of the insights from that session and, and some, some of your takeaway messages for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, Jean-Bart, thank you for this. Antonio, thank you. Jean-Bart, we met last time six years ago. And as you know, I am not exactly in this maritime data. So first of all, congratulations, because uh, in the last few weeks, I saw how much Emodnet developed. Thank you. Having said that, I will be very quickly. Uh, yesterday, uh, there was, as mentioned, co-organized by the Municipality of Genoa and the Commission, an important meeting of stakeholders of the mission Restore Our Ocean and Waters. I will not enter into detail. There is Digimare here. We know better than me what the mission is. But the point is, <clears throat> Yesterday, to cut it short, um, we presented two important things in this meeting. First of all, the coalition of mayors, more than 250 mayors, joined and shared their plan to um, contribute to the mission. But secondly, which is more relevant for your meeting today, um, several operators, ship owners not only, all stressing the importance of data for their job, including the Navy, Admiral Nannini from the Oceanographic Institute, including the Coast Guard, uh, MSC, etc. All happy that technology and knowledge is available, and many happy willing ready to do what GMV is doing since a long time, so offering the ship as a platform of opportunity. I think, and I stop because uh, you have <laughs> already had a long day, I think that this is the best message. Um, and also, I personally think that this is very relevant from the point of view of the mission, which is trying to coalize any effort already in the your union portfolio as EMODNET or outside on the common goal. So again, well done, because this uh, is, uh, is also your, uh, your uh, success. Uh, six years ago, you know that 
in the maritime field, it was not so clear to operators the potential, the usefulness, and also that they could contribute easily. Now it is very clear, and this is your success. That's it, I think. Thank you. Um, is it okay if I pass on from that to Remy, if he's with us? Before coming to you, Taco, let's try the connection. Yeah, I am, well, I, I can hear you. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, we can hear you as well. That's, uh, that's already good news. So, Remy, I, I was wondering if you, you had the time to reflect a little bit on what we've been discussing today and also um, maybe bringing it a little bit back to um, the European policies, of course, the, the, the European Green Deal, um, and maybe also from, from what you hear and what, what the Commission knows in terms of advice, what, what you consider some of the priority areas for further research. Because, yes, we have achieved a lot, but the challenges are great still. There's still a lot we don't know. Uh, and certain things we need to tackle. What are those priorities as well from the Commission's perspective? Remy, please. Yes. So regarding the Green Deal, uh, so it's a kind of overarching initiative, if you want, which encompasses many uh, different legislation. Uh, so one of the key objectives is no net emission of greenhouse gases by 2050. Uh, so what's, what's the role of ocean observation in this? But I, I would say most of the legislation in, in the Green Deal are, are about to minimize and to, to stop CO2 uh, emissions, and, and rightly so. Um, ha having said that, of course, uh, we need to be able to, to understand the role of the ocean. So we, we, there are different percentages uh, which uh, circulate, like 25% of uh, man-made emission are absorbed by uh, our oceans, and, but this is uh, probably also contributing to the acidity of the of the water. So, so basically, what we need to do with uh, ocean observation is really to be able to better understand the role of the ocean in all the all of these CO2 uh, exchanges and, and balances, and uh, and to be able to observe the, also the health uh, of the oceans with uh, with contaminants contaminants and all, all, the, all, all, all what ends up in the, in the ocean. So I would say that's one of the, one of the key, um, certainly one of the key role of, uh, of, of ocean observation. Uh, we have a green deal, but we, we do not have a blue deal yet. <laughs> um, under the green deal, you have also the biodiversity strategy. So here again, uh, with ocean observation, we need to be able to monitor the, the biodiversity uh, in, in the seas. Uh, you have the Zero Pollution Action Plan, which include uh, things about plastics, uh, contaminants, uh, quality of water, microplastics. So we, um, we've heard uh, in, the, in the previous uh, speeches about uh, all of this uh, CO2 plastics. Uh, and, uh, and the nature restoration law would fall also under the Green Deal. Uh, I would say, unfortunately, the, the European Parliament today uh, somehow gave uh, a, a negative opinion to this proposal for the time being. Uh, here again, uh, the, the difficulty is to, is to consile the, the economic aspect. So those who are living from the sea and exploiting the sea uh, compared to the um, and to the environmental uh, aspects, basically. Uh, and, th and then to your second question in terms of research and innovation. So, well, you just uh, commented about uh, Mission Ocean, uh, and, and indeed Mission Ocean will well, is, is one of, the, well, is defining uh, very clear lines uh, for the restoration of our waters, so seas and water, so not, not just salty waters, but also uh, uh, fresh waters by, by 2030 and, and uh, calling for um, well, technological solutions, uh, certainly. And if I think of OSH, so hopefully with all these projects that will be funded, we will also learn, so there will be observation made. Uh, so we, we hope that uh, well, we will certainly encourage very much the projects to to collect the data and make it available under a for the benefit of uh, all the community. 
And uh, there is, as you know, this project of digital twin ocean, so to develop a, a digital model of oceans. Uh, it, it goes uh, together with uh, the so-called destination Earth, which is a digital model of the planet. And uh, I would say a good uh, deal of this, or one, one of the goal, is to use this modeling uh, for policy purposes, so to, to run scenarios, uh, what if uh, we do this, what if we act at that time uh, with this magnitude, uh, and, and what would be the response of the uh, ocean. So this is one part, of course, there's, there's also a very uh, scientific part and uh, on understanding um, better accuracy and better resolution. Uh, so, so that's that's in a nutshell what uh, what I can answer to your two points, uh, Jan Bart. Thank you, Remy. Um, very clear. I would want to now take it up um, to the global level and then also ask if you have any reflections on that, both Remy and Mario, before we open the floor to uh, to questions. So, um, Taco earlier today presented some of the tools and developments within the international domain to help with uh, marine data and information exchange to work towards this you know, trustworthy and accessible digital ecosystem, if you like. Um, would you like to reflect a little bit more about what global resources are already available and what is missing in your understanding? Um. I would like to start, well, with the missing part, <laughs> um, because this morning I argued that it is difficult to identify gaps, gaps in observations, gaps in data, so long as you don't have the complete overview. And so it would be a bit strange to say now that we can identify the gaps already. I mean, not that much happened between this morning and this afternoon. Um, but nevertheless, what we saw this whole day was that we can indeed identify gaps in general. Um, that is the deep ocean, uh, the remote oceans, and um, the, um, well, the entire ocean, including the coastal seas, for many of the parameters except for temperature and salinity, perhaps. Um, but the special emphasis today was, a, it, it kind of looked like the Southern Ocean Symposium today. <laughs> uh, and that is not coincidental. It's not just because the, um, uh, some of the speakers uh, uh, have their um, uh, research area in the Southern Ocean, but because of the importance of uh, the both polar oceans. They're remote, they're not well known because they are remote. Um, but they are, are of crucial importance for the changes that we, that we notice regionally um, for the climate change. Uh, the effects of, the remote, of those remote regions are um, uh, far greater than their, uh, their area uh, would, uh, would um, uh, don't know the word in English, but you understand what I mean. Mm. Um, so, um, this is a good reason that we pay attention to those remote waters, to the um, uh, both uh, polar oceans, especially the southern ocean, I would say. Um, and there is also, um, perhaps that's a link to, to what Jan Bart was referring to in his presentation later of, uh, earlier today. Um, there is this uh, UN Ocean Decade for Sustainable Development. And uh, one of the uh, important uh, parts is that there has been a Southern Ocean Action Plan developed to address many of the issues that the um, UN Decade wants to address. And um, I think that as a, as a community, as a research and data community, we should... Um, uh, pay much more attention and try to um, get the research for the, for the Southern Ocean and the, and the Arctic Ocean much better um, funded and developed uh, to address the 
uh, UN decade and the um, uh, sustainable development goals of the UN, um, because of the climate change implications for all of us. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you, thank you very much. Very good point. And I will, I will bounce that a little bit back uh, in a way to, uh, as we are talk, spark, talking about the decade, the ocean decade in some way, as a, as a mean, as an opportunity to lift up that scientific collaboration to a new level. Um, maybe bringing it back to, to Remy, um, because we were talking about the European Commission perspective on uh, marine data and ocean uh, observation, the European context, uh, how a lot of coordination needs to, to happen both upstream and uh, more at the marine data and information exchange. A lot of, of things have ha already happened. When we were at the Digital Forum a couple of weeks ago, uh, we heard about all of these developments also contributing to global challenges and the decade. Um, a lot of these are either voluntary or, or ad hoc here and there. But um, how, how do, do these European um, efforts connect and fit in the broader international context and, and how can they be leveraged um, and made more visible as, a, as an EU contribution in a way? So, well, of course, uh, as representing the European Commission, well, our, our first uh, duty is to concentrate on, uh, on the EU member states and hopefully we well, we, we do we, we do our best, uh, but but of course we don't forget the uh, the international context. Uh, so we are fully aware of uh, all the global initiatives like the Global Ocean Observing System. We are part of IOC UNESCO. We have uh, of course we are committed to uh, SDG 14 uh, in, in the context of. Uh, of the UN decade, uh, I think uh, Kestutis uh, Saudoskas, our DDG, was uh, with you this morning. He will go to the to to the, to celebrate the 10 years of the Galway Statement. So we, we are part of all these uh, these agreements, and uh, of course, seas and ocean have no have no borders. They, they don't stop at the at the borders of our EU uh, states. Um, also. I don't know if this was publicized. Well, I, I think so because I saw it quite uh, quite a lot in, in the news. Uh, but you have this. We are participating in this negotiation on the biodiversity beyond the national jurisdiction in the context of UN negotiation, and uh, th there was a successful, let's say, outcome uh, where the um, the members who, who are signatory of this uh, agreement commit to uh, develop 30% of marine protected areas, so beyond the national jurisdiction, by 2030. Today we have 1%, so it's a very ambitious goal. Uh, and there are also, of course, all kind of uh, provision on the biodiversity, also on scientific research, so to share more at global level uh, regarding scientific uh, cruises, for example. Uh, so, so I would say yes, we we are there. Uh, I would say first we have to do uh, our homework, so to be well coordinated uh, in, in the EU. Uh, so I, I know that, for example, Emodnet is is one example where I think the EU is, uh, I mean, shows a good example of coordination and and can take this to uh, to the international context. Uh, it, it, it's not in all domains like this. Uh, so it's, uh, I, I try to show the, uh, at the beginning of this, uh, of this session how complex was the situation already in the EU. Uh, it is not less complex in the international context. Uh, so we, we have to, to do our utmost to whatever we do to, to stay compatible, to stay uh, aware and, uh, and, and yeah, and be ready to, to collaborate in any international context. Thank you. Thank you, Remy. And, and, and I, I think there is um, a very good point about the maturity of some of the initiatives that can uh, readily be uh, exported in a way or exploited at the global level. Like Imotnet, it has a level of maturity that really directly supports uh, the global ambitions uh, and can probably do more. But probably the best contribution that, that Europe can do towards global ocean observing capacities is by yeah, making sure that the, the, the European coordination and sustained 
uh, operation of this European Global Observing System is, is well in order. So that, that getting to that point will already be a major uh, step forward for the global community as well. Thanks for that contribution. I'm going to just, it's not obligation, but if you have a point, Mario, please. <laughs> Before then, I will open the, the floor for questions um, from the audience. We also have Jean-Baptiste still online, and normally we should also have Petra van Hopen. So if you have any questions for any of the other speakers as well, this will be your afterwards. Please. Yes, a very quick one, uh, not to take more of your time, much of your time. Uh, first of all, okay, as you can guess, Fondation, Fondation Philippe Cousteau comes from uh, uh, Jacques Cousteau and Philippe, who died prematurely, and uh, is uh, uh, also called the Union of the Ocean, so is uh, uh, perfect. One point, yesterday, one of the ship owners, uh, Swan Hellenic, they are specialized with very small ships. They go in Antarctica and uh, in, the, in, the, in the Arctic and in very pristine areas. Yesterday they said, we are there, just come. Th they even realized on board the ship a very small, teeny laboratory for you. Mm. Because they go in places where very few ships go. So that is already a good achievement. And the second, jean bart I don't want to give you more work, but <laughs> as you correctly said, Mission Ocean and water, fresh water, drinking water. There should be something like a mod net for this. Maybe already exists, I don't know. Very useful. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll obviously, all the colleagues will be very happy to share <laughs> the expertise um, in all directions. So I'm going to look around and see if there are any questions or are, are people exhausted after this long afternoon and the heat and the excitement from the ocean race. Juanjo, will you kick it? Can you say for who your question is? Or I think for you probably. For well, I am a little bit surprised when you say that we don't have remote uh, areas. Remote is Jupiter not the Antarctica. We have the Scientific Committee of Antarctic Research. We have now small ship, which even are able to pass, to cross the Drake Passage with a wave of 20 meters, which I don't know how they do it. And we have Antarctic Treaty. So there is a lot of things going on. On top of that, and I have been there looking into a French polar vessel, German polar vessel, British polar vessel, Spanish polar vessel, and I don't, I don't know how many polar vessels sitting in the same place, in the same harbor, at the same time, doing the same thing. So for me, it's more a matter of collaboration, integration, and planning. Because it's completely stupid that Europeans will invest a lot of money at the national level to share data, which is the same thing. And I think we could do much more with the same amount of tools that we already have by sharing the plans. And this is quite complex, mm -hmm. apparently. I mean, sharing the plan is investing in meetings and knowing what are the planning of the different nations. Mm -hmm. Because if we attack the global ocean at individual way, I think we are far away. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's remote or not. For me, it's more remote to go to the Pocupe and Abyssal Plain, which is 4,000 meter water depth close to, the, to Portugal than to go to the Pasta Drake, which is on the other side of the planet, which is really, in our days, w you know, the Voyager 1 left the galaxy last week. Bueno. <laughs> it's more like a statement, which is also perfectly fine uh, than a question, but point, uh, point well made, I think. Um, are there any other questions? I had actually a question before. Can, 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 can I react you, you to that, want, If you want to react, yes, please because go ahead. Because while you were speaking, I saw Rin Veronica not mm. enthusiastically about what you were saying. Um, and she gave the presentation on her eyes, and uh, I fully understand that. Um, and yes, of course, I agree that uh, better coordination is, is uh, really necessary. Um, but yet, even though we have these resources available and these research vessels in the same harbor, as you said, um, Jean-Baptiste Net just showed the map of observations where in the Argo plot, um, the Southern Ocean was almost empty. 
in the CTD plot that he showed, everything beneath um, or below uh, 40,000 was empty, hardly any measurements. So in that respect, the, uh, the Southern Ocean is remote. And um, what I also um, I, I consider it remote because what we see is that uh, a lot of um, national and uh, regional funding in Europe, for instance, is, and, and I, of course I understand that you can only spend your money once and um, you need to pay attention to regional effects. So Europe wants to know through EMODNET, for instance, what happens in the um, European waters. Uh, so the emphasis is on European waters for Europe. But what happens, as Andrew clearly showed, what happens uh, in the um, a southern ocean, where there is hardly any measurement, any observation done, what happens in the southern ocean um, affects uh, our well-being here in Europe and in the entire globe. So that's why I argued that we should um, uh, put more emphasis on um, uh, uh, observations in uh, remote areas. Uh, as the both polar uh, oceans. Thank you. Thank you. And I would say that that's why it's so important that projects like Arise and Polarin mm. are supported because they are providing a coordination platform to do this kind of activities. Yeah, and I was I was going to pass the microphone to to Veronica to comment perhaps, and also in, in because maybe you mentioned it during your presentation, but you have these different. Uh, exchange programs and collaboration between, you have Eurofleets as well, do you have, how do you collaborate, how does that connect and, and yeah. Well, first, first I would like yeah, to point please, please <laughs> again to this uh, issue of the, of the collaboration and the sharing of uh, schedules. As you know very well, this is something we have tried in Arise. And uh, it, is, it is a need. All the operators even uh, agreed that we are duplicating efforts because of also a bad use of the vessels. We are using icebreakers in areas where other vessels, less powerful, could be operating more efficiently. Mm. But of course, on the other hand, you have the national interests, which are stronger than the international or European interests. And this is a barrier, and it's very, very difficult to go through. And new projects, by the way, from the European Commission, are not allowing any more these networking activities, which are absolutely necessary because we still need to network within the community to ensure that we are using the infrastructures in the best way possible. So that's only just a little comment. And now, um, commenting on the relation with Eurofleets, actually, Arise is a spin-off from Eurofleets. Mm -hmm. So uh, and in uh, Eurofleets 2, there was a polar vision um, that we were leading uh, from AVI and uh, to, to, to implement, to try to implement this uh, access to the poles because they are remote areas. So even if they are close by, um, they are nevertheless very difficult to access. And what we realized is that we could not do this integration together with Eurofleets, the access to the poles. Mainly, it was a budget issue. The access to icebreakers is so expensive that we would eat the budget of Eurofleets, of the other, of all the other uh, regional or, or even ocean-going vessels. So it's a matter of budget that we divided, but we actually use the same access uh, protocols. Uh, we use the same evaluation process. So we are just more focused on the polar regions, and but this is mainly a, it's a budget situation. Okay. Rational but we will be if we are, in an, so we are always collaborating, of mm -hmm. course, we mm -hmm. are very well connected and we try to link, of course, always uh, activities in the Arctic, so in the Arctic with the North Atlantic or mm -hmm. some, something like that to try to, of course, give a, a better picture to everything we do. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm wary of time. I think it's time to wrap up. It was extremely interesting and... Um, I would like to thank the colleagues from uh, joining us on stage, Taco, Mario, and Remy remotely. Please give them a, a warm round of applause. <laughs> and also, before we close off, a warm applause for all of the speakers of today. Really great, fantastic.
I will pass over to you, Antonio, to close off and maybe some practical information as well for the coming days. So I want to thank you, Jan Bart, for helping us in the chatting uh, this session. That was quite, uh, I mean, very intense. <laughs> and we uh, gained a lot of information. I want also to thank, I mean, my colleagues that, I mean, are helping us, and especially Valeria, because without her, yeah. <laughs> this won't be possible. <laughs> And then some practical information. I mean, as you know, this is only the first day <laughs> of a series of days. So you are welcome and uh, invited to attend. I mean, anytime you want during the next day. So tomorrow we are going to speak about uh, more about the coordination in planning, how, I mean, we can make the best use of the data that we collect, how to transform the data into products and uh, real services, downstream services. Then the next day, we are speaking more about uh, some kind of pollution that we may have in the ocean. So we're speaking about uh, acidification. We are speaking about underwater noise. So it's also nice. Uh, also, how this affects biodiversity. And then we have a final uh, session on Friday that is about uh, cost-effective technologies. Uh, Today we touched this topic several times because we are speaking about citizen science, but citizen science uh, goes back to back with uh, cost-effective technologies. So in order to see which is the status of art, okay, I invite you again on Friday session because it's nice to, I mean, see which is the update from the thing. So um, thank you for staying uh, uh, the full day, in a very intense day. I, I mean, give again a warm applause to all of you. <laughs> And then I, I invite you to enjoy what is left in the, I mean, the, uh, in the back of the room and enjoy the, I mean, the visit of uh, the Ocean Village and celebrate with all the Ocean Rays, the, I mean, the party that they are going to start. <laughs> Thank you again, guys.